Morning everyone, welcome to this Teach Me English Icons event, our first event of 2022. Thank you so much for joining us at half nine on Saturday morning. My name is Sarah Williams and I'm the coordinator for TM English Icons and joining me today are two members, Richard MacDonald, Amy Smith and Rachel Boddy. Uh, we're really happy to be with you today. This is actually the third English Icons event, so big shout out to Lizzie Harvey for bringing us the last two years. Uh, it's hard to believe that the last in real life event took place in Manchester, uh, sorry, in Sheffield, um, way back in February 2020. It was a pleasure to attend that one in person. And obviously last year's main event went online due to the pandemic. But that's a great opportunity to reach a wider audience and what an event that was. So here we are, new year, new team. And we're delighted to be bringing you some incredible events this year, both online and face to face. Um, we'll actually be releasing information about our in real life event in Manchester later on in the day. So um, if you like what you see today and you'd like to do this in person for free with a free bar, then please do give us a follow at TM English Icon and we'll be posting um, more information on there and making some exciting announcements very soon. So of course our events both uh, online and in real could not take place without the fabulous support from our sponsors and we'll be hearing from them throughout the show so we'll be um listening out for pupil progress and teachers love stationery club later on in the event but today we're kicking off with a key stage three special and we're um, absolutely delighted to hear from our fabulous speakers today who are giving up their time to share their thoughts and experiences with the english community so if you're just finding us by chance this morning um, on Twitch, then please do head over to our page and check out the programme, as we do have quite the lineup um, and quite a diverse range of topics for you this morning regarding Key Stage 3 English. So there's still time to check out our programme if you haven't done so already. Um, I'm actually going to hand over to Amy Smith now, who's going to run you through some information about how you can get involved today via social media. So Amy, over to you. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm running the social media this morning. So we are currently streaming live to YouTube and to Twitter. I think we've currently got around 50 mark on YouTube. And I know that's going to go up to, to quite a much higher number as we go through the morning. And um, so welcome if you're just joining us. Um, there's still time to sign up for the recording as well. So if you can't um, stay online for the whole morning, head over to our Twitter page at TM English Icons and you can find the link there on our pinned tweet to sign up for the recording this morning. Apart from that, there's lots of ways to get involved today. So make sure that you're tweeting using the hashtag TMingIcons. Okay, it's a little bit different from our Twitter handle. So we've uh, made it a little bit shorter so that you can squeeze more words into the tweet. So it's hashtag TMingIcons. If you are tweeting using that hashtag, then you'll be automatically entered into a raffle for some um, really useful classroom technology. But we will talk to you about that later in the morning. Um, you can also get involved um, by talking to our speakers online. So they will be sharing their Twitter handles at the start of each presentation. Or you can use the Twitter handle at TM English Icons um, to ask some questions um, about their presentations. As well as that, we've got a couple of competitions happening today. So the first one is a selfie competition. So I'll be looking for the most creative, inspired, enthusiastic selfie um, showing you attending this morning's event. Um, I know lots of people have got literary mugs out there that they'll want to have in their selfies. Um, so make sure that you, you tweet a selfie with the hashtag TM Ink Icons. And if you tweet about what you love about Key Stage 3, you'll also be in the mix for a prize. So the prizes are really exciting. We've got a number of books that have been um, donated to us by the authors. So we have a book called The Trouble with English by Sam Gibbs. Absolutely wonderful book recently published. Um, we have some copies of Mary Myatt's um, Her Curriculum Conversations. Um, so they're up for grabs as well this morning. We have a pack of books on retrieval by Kate Jones. 
and we have two passes to Laura Webb's online CPD package, as well as some technology coming up later in the morning. So there's quite a few opportunities to win. So make sure you're joining in online. The hashtag is TM Ing Icons, um, and our Twitter handle is at TM English Icons. So why not take a selfie now? Um, I'm going to pass back to Sarah, I think, um, to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much, Amy. So Amy and Rachel have the hardest jobs today um, because they're tasked with making sure this whole thing runs smoothly behind the scenes. <laughs> so no pressure. In a moment, they're going to disappear backstage um, and leave Richard and I, which is going to be my co-host today. So guys, I'll let you disappear backstage. Thank you very much. Okay, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our first keynote this morning, and that's the very wonderful Freya O'Dell. Um, Freya has 20 years experience of teaching English, and throughout that time, she's taken on a wide variety of roles, including Head of English and Director of Teaching and Learning. Currently, she's enjoying being back in the classroom and enjoying all that Rome has to offer. Um, we're absolutely delighted that she's speaking for us today. When we as a team first decided that the theme for this event would be Key Stage 3, we knew straight away that we needed to have Freya as, as one of our keynotes and we're absolutely delighted that she agreed to speak today. And that's because she has a genuine uh, passion and enthusiasm for all things Key Stage 3 and she shares that widely with the English community on Twitter. And I'm actually going to Give you a, a, a well, I'm actually going to quote Alice Visser Fury this morning um, because when we first announced our program for this event, Alice tweeted um, that Freya is an absolutely inspirational woman. She, uh, she said that she's genuine, she's empathetic, she is kind, and she is honest. And Alice described Freya as a powerhouse educator who's made a difference in the lives of so many. And I think Alice expresses it better than I can. So with that, we're going to get Freya on screen. Morning, everyone. <laughs> Morning, Freya. We're absolutely delighted that you're speaking for us today. I'm, I'm delighted as well, a little bit nervous. Can you see my screen properly? Is that okay? Yes. Sort of. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Do you want to just try the next slide? It's just cut off for me at the top. Let's just have a go. There we go. That's better. We'll work with it. I mean, during this time, we've got used to technology and all the mishaps, so we'll just work with it. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so Rich and I are going to disappear backstage now that you're all set up, ready to go. Um, okay. we'll you. We won't keep people waiting any longer. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. It is um, an absolute honour to be with you this morning, live from Rome and my classroom today. So I want to start actually by saying a massive thank you to the Teach Me uh, English Icons team who have put together a fantastic schedule celebrating the joy that is Key Stage 3 English teaching. And um, I'm personally buzzing to hear from all of the incredible speakers this morning, learn lots, and I'm armed with my notebook to take lots of notes. So um, in keynoting today, I've decided to focus in on the brilliant work that we have all been doing in constructing Key Stage 3 curriculums that really support our pupils to be the very best that they can be. I'm not approaching today's talk from a research perspective, and I am certainly not the most intelligent voice on this matter, but I am going to talk about my reflections as someone who is passionate about our younger pupils and has had a fair amount of experience in working on the curriculum. So the title of the talk is obviously a clear reference and response to the Ofsted document, The Wasted Years from 2015, and it makes for bleak reading. The conclusions drawn from this report stated that Key Stage 3 was not a high priority for many leaders, that the quality of teaching and the rate of pupils' progress and achievement was not good enough, that one in five inspections revealed that slow progress was being made in English with the academically more able pupils not being stretched enough, 
that many schools weren't working effectively with their partner primary schools to understand prior learning and therefore weren't building effectively on this and that homework was not consistently providing the pupils with a chance to consolidate or extend their learning. And it's bleak on the one hand in terms of how Key Stage 3 was viewed back then, but to me today, those statements are statements that are not recognisable, which I think is reflective of the incredible work we have done in really dedicating time and space to curricular thinking lower down the school. And whilst um, curriculum is a continual part of the discussions we have as departments, especially in terms of its anchoring of good quality teaching and learning, we can't help but also feel that the new Ofsted framework brought about in 2019 and updated in 2020, perhaps in response to the wasted years research, has enacted a more thorough examination of what we offer our pupils at Key Stage 3. As professionals, the framework asks us to ensure that our Key Stage 3 curriculum is ambitious and demanding, that it gives pupils the knowledge and the cultural capital they need to succeed in life, that it is coherently planned and sequenced towards cumulatively sufficient knowledge and skills for future learning, that it helps pupils to remember and integrate new knowledge into larger ideas that it uses assessment well to help pupils embed this knowledge and to check their understanding and inform our teaching, and that it prioritises reading. And these priorities have been a focal point for many since 2019. A short and not extensive poll I conducted this week, in fact, revealed that just under 65% of teachers felt that the framework had reinstigated focus work on their Key Stage 3 curricular offerings. So when thinking about curriculum, I think for me, there are four key questions we need to be considering. What is it pupils need to be able to do? What is it that pupils need to know? How best can we sequence the development of skills and knowledge in order to arrive at a coherently planned curriculum? And how will pupils demonstrate all of their learning? Like many departments, we here in Rome came together to think about this progression, working backwards from IB and IGCC and our pupils' desired endpoints. We started with a focus on skills, what pupils needed to be able to do or demonstrate in order to attain the highest possible grades, and tracked these skills back, identifying the necessary small incremental steps that would aid pupils in achieving the end goal. For example, in year 13, pupils are expected to construct convincing, insightful and persuasive interpretations of the larger implications and subtleties of the text. We then, as a collective, asked ourselves and each other what core steps the pupils would need to take in order to be able to confidently do that when they hit year 13. Things like making a simple inference, beginning to offer multiple interpretations, and then starting to find the cleverest things to say about a text. In doing so, we were able to create a clear sequence of progression to really aid pupils in their skill acquisition and development. This by no means, though, is an uncommon process, with many departments working in this way. However, what has become clearer is the importance of articulating these steps in a multitude of ways so that pupils' understanding of how they can develop with their learning is made abundantly clear. The first way in which we do this is by ensuring our assessment objectives in a simplified format are stuck into the front of pupil exercise books so that they can be referred to throughout the year. The importance of pupil-friendly language is key in ensuring a clear understanding of the skills we are looking to develop and what they need to do with those skills within each piece of work. Using the terminology, for example, of writing assessment objective one, two or three in conjunction with a form of due coding here and introduced by our key stage three lead as frequently as possible means that pupils begin to garner a familiarity and a clearer understanding of the skills being learned within and across particular lessons. Here is an example of how we simply link the assessment objectives to our big question for that lesson and also how the icons are used within our booklet resources to remind pupils of the skills being targeted. This links into the idea of intentionality that Jennifer Webb spoke about more recently in her online webinar reading. She argued that when we read, for example, we read for different reasons. We read to understand, to find literal information, to infer, to summarise. So explicitly foregrounding and drawing attention to particular skills helps pupils with their understanding of the processes that they need to undertake in order to complete a task successfully. 
Working walls are another way in which core skill development can be tracked and that pupils can be supported with this. On the screen, you can see my working wall for the Year 7 Mythology Unit. Across the teaching of this unit, the wall was added to. Initially, the Tier 2 vocabulary was popped onto the wall to encourage pupils to use the ambitious words within their own pieces of writing. As we began to think about how to structure and organise the myth, um, our co-constructed narrative plan went up on the wall. When pupils use dictionaries and thesauruses to identify ambitious adjectives to describe setting and character, they pop these onto a post-it note to share. Finally, when we explored how to craft effective extended similes and metaphors, pupils chose one they were particularly proud of to stick up for others to see. The working wall therefore became a tool to support pupils in their skill development and something that they could refer to and utilise across the unit within their written work, drawing upon the work of their peers and best exemplars. However, my work award is rubbish in comparison to the incredible work of Sophie Merrill. So I suggest you check her Twitter account or get in touch with her to see really excellent examples of these in action. And finally, and I'm going to ignore the, the, the PowerPoint offset, so bear with me with that. And finally, one thing I used within my year seven class when preparing them for the writing of their myth was the use, use of process-based success criteria as recommended by Shirley Clark in her book, Unlocking Learning Intentions and Success Criteria. It's a really simple strategy, but has proved to be really effective in supporting pupils to think about the intentionality of their choices. When writing the exposition paragraph to our myth, I identified some of the core skills I wanted pupils to demonstrate in their writing. For example, I wanted their first paragraph, their exposition, to be a long paragraph, but I also stated why I wanted this in terms of what we were hoping to achieve as a result. Similarly, in encouraging pupils to use ambitious adjectives within their writing, I made it clear why those ambitious adjectives within their writing were needed, were important. We wanted to create a suspenseful atmosphere, and so pupils needed to think really carefully about the adjectives they were going to use in order to be able to do this if they wanted to be effective in their writing. While some may argue that this is a highly scaffolded approach, the aim would be over key stage three that the scaffolding is removed because pupils will A, be a lot clearer on the skills they need to demonstrate, and B, why they need to demonstrate them. In fact, Shirley Clark argues that step two is about co-constructing the success criteria with pupils, at which point teachers could work on extracting the skill being demonstrated, but also the intentionality behind it. All of these strategies are ridiculously simple, but when combined together to work to support pupils in understanding what it is that they need to do or demonstrate how they can go about doing this. Frequent explicit exposure to our assessment objectives and our purposeful direction in lessons means that pupils not only understand the skills they need to demonstrate in their work, but also how they can go about developing their skills and improving what they do. So my final thought when it comes to thinking about what pupils can do or demonstrate is about how well our pupils can articulate the skills learned or the steps that they need to take to create something like an effective narrative. To explore this, I've been using Flipgrid and video journaling. Again, apologies for the formatting here. After we finished the mythology unit, I wanted pupils to reflect on the skills they felt they had learned through the unit. So I set them the task of creating a video journal using Flipgrid. For obvious reasons, I'm not going to share the videos created by my pupils, but I am going to share snippets of what was said. In response to a series of questions, Pupil A made the following comment. About narratives, I've learned how to structure a myth, doing the exposition and rising action and new writing techniques. I've learned to use better adjectives. I did a bigger paragraph to make more, to describe the setting better and to describe the characters with lots of adjectives. I've learned how to not overuse dialogue and how to punctuate it. Now, this was really interesting, firstly, in terms of what pupils could remember and what they could not. Secondly, in terms of sharing what skills they felt they had developed. Thirdly, in terms of identifying misconceptions. And lastly, in terms of confidence rating in areas they wanted to practice further. However, there were also limitations. My questioning was overpowering and there was a real lack of intentionality in their responses with regard to the effects of their choices. In addition, it really wasn't very metacognitive in terms of exploring how pupils would go about creating an effective narrative, all of which was down to me. So in the next unit, I decided to try again and do better. 
So before sitting their reading assessment on Barnaby Brockett, in which pupils were tasked with writing a what, how, why paragraph, I decided to set my pupils a homework task to ask them to explain to me how they would go about writing a what, how, why paragraph. This is what pupil B said. So at the start, you need to analyze the principal themes of Barnaby Brockett, and then using an extract from this paragraph, introduce your inference. Then you need to support your inference with quotations taken from the text. Having done so, you need to think about what that reveals. After that, you have to choose the technique, verb, adjective, or noun from your inference, and say how that word informs the reader by using the dictionary definition of that word. Then there is the why part, which you need to think about, what Boyne is asking his readers to consider. Depending on your inference, an intelligent way of doing that is just by reading your inference and then reflect yourself. What do you consider based on your inference? And then in doing so, what do the readers learn? Regardless of whether you agree with the process, this is so much more highly metacognitive with the pupil having thought clearly about the steps and showing a great understanding of what he needed to do when he got into the assessment if he was to construct a strong analytical paragraph of writing. For me, other than the actual written what, how, why, this is the end product whereby having been explicitly exposed to the skills, the steps, the intentionality, pupils can articulate their learning process clearly and the choices they make and why. So the second question surrounding curriculum is what it is that we feel pupils need to know and much work has already been done in this area. When considering knowledge, we once again found ourselves as a department coming together to explore what pupils were going to study at IB and IGCSE and how the key stage three curriculum could best support this as a result. So, for example, when we looked at the IGCSE curriculum, we knew that pupils were going to study a Shakespearean play, a piece of modern drama, unseen poetry, anthology poetry and a modern novel. And this told us that pupils therefore needed to have a foundational knowledge of these different forms of literature and the conventions associated with each in order to be prepared for this. We also knew that pupils would read a range of non-fiction texts and complete a transactional writing task. So within Key Stage 3, it became evident that it was important for our pupils to understand the different forms of writing and the conventions for each. Working backwards again was a really useful starting point for us in beginning to construct a carefully sequenced Key Stage 3 curriculum. And of course, we have our go-to national curriculum document that sets out the expected knowledge for each key stage, reminding us that it is important to remember what pupils will arrive to us knowing at the start of Year 7, especially in terms of grammar knowledge. However, we don't just want our pupils' knowledge to be rooted in what they need to know in order to pass an examination. So asking ourselves the question, what should an academically brilliant English IB pupil know when they leave our school, poses some interesting responses about the beauty of our discipline. We had discussions around literary timelines and critical theory amongst others, prompting us to think harder and deeper about our curriculum offering. And when we have the knowledge we wish to impart and the skills that we wish to develop, the question becomes about how we sequence these in order to arrive at a coherently planned curriculum. And there are a number of ways that this can be done. For me, a conceptual approach helps to offer a level of coherence to our curriculum planning. Key concepts, first of all, or themes or big ideas are universal, timeless, abstract and broad ideas that help pupils towards higher levels of thinking because of the connections they can begin to make between text time periods and cultures. When people shared their curriculums via Twitter last week, many had identified concepts or more broader themes on which they had based their curriculums. For example, in year seven, someone shared that they had organized their curriculum with a key concept of heroism as the focal point. In year eight, vices and virtues of humanity, and in year nine, alienation and rebellion, prompting for me the delivery of what seems like an incredibly focused, interesting and engaging curriculum. Our Year 7 curriculum, for example, takes the key concept of identity, with each unit exploring a different aspect of this, making all units purposeful. When studying myths, we explore our origins and sense of cultural identity. When reading Barnaby Brockett, we explore his journey towards accepting his own identity. When writing memoirs, pupils are focused on expressing who they are. Our poetry unit helps pupils consider personal versus cultural identity. And when studying Shakespeare, pupils are asked to consider the female identity with Shakespeare's plays. 
Not only do pupils therefore explore the complexity of such a concept from a range of different perspectives and angles across the year, building their level of criticality, but they are able to see how different texts approach the big idea, enabling comparison and contrast. Finally, the irrelevance of time with regard to the concept from Shakespeare to the modern day means that pupils can also identify the relevance this has to their lives, making what we do in the classroom more meaningful to them. At the end of each year, we celebrate this learning with an oracy project. Pupils are asked to put together a poster presentation in response to the key concept, outlining what they have learned from across the year in the hope that they will draw upon all of the texts that the unit studied. When I did this for the first time last year, I was blown away with what the pupils produced, their understanding of the key concept, the connections they made, and the depth of thinking in response. But we also need to consider the related concepts and the concepts that are rooted in the specific discipline of English when structuring our curriculum. These concepts promote a depth of learning and add coherence to the understanding of academic subjects and disciplines. When I reached out to Twitter about their Key Stage 3 curriculums, Mrs M Kennedy shared how her department had organised their curriculum using related or disciplinary concepts, provoking a lot of thought. David Dadao has written about the organisation of his curriculum using concepts such as these in his excellent book, Making Meaning in English. And the NYP, a framework I think is really interesting, identifies the related concepts for teaching between years 7 and 11. Therefore, each unit we teach, not, not only do we have the key concept as our anchor, but we also identify two to three related concepts that steer the knowledge and skill sets we are looking to deliver. When studying myths, our key concept was about our origin and cultural identity, but the related concept was focused on structure and more specifically narrative structure. Pupils learned about Freytag's narrative pyramid in terms of their knowledge but then were helped to apply this in order to skillfully craft their own myth. In the novel unit, the key concept was self-discovery and the related concepts were focused on point of view and character. Pupils learned in terms of their knowledge about the character of Barnaby Brockett through his encounters with a variety of people, but they were supported to develop their skills of analysis when writing about Barnaby. For me, the beauty of utilising key concepts and related concepts is how they help to bring core knowledge and skill development together into a coherent approach. And of course, the nice thing about related concepts is they are explored on a continual basis throughout the key stage and returned to. We return again to these related concepts in year eight and then in year nine and actually in year 10 and year 11 as well, which adds coherence to our work. Furthermore, the use of both key and related concepts really underpins the work we do in supporting our pupils with reading. For each unit we teach, we establish linked readers or an anthology of extracts of linked readers. Framing the unit with a key concept and specific related concepts means that the focus of our extract choices is much more nuanced and appropriate to what we are studying. For example, when studying Barnaby Brockett with the key concept of identity and the related concepts of character and point of view, I can select extracts that seek to really exemplify these concepts further and help build pupil understanding. And then we use Padlet to then track this reading, asking pupils to reflect upon both the key concept and the related concept in their written responses to see how their understanding of these concepts grow over time. Lastly, when we've considered skill development, knowledge development and conceptual understanding, we need to consider how our pupils will demonstrate what they have learned and can do. And the truth of the matter is, um, and something that I try to tell my pupils all the time, is that the pupils are demonstrating their learning all of the time, every single lesson, whether it be at the start of a lesson through recap and retention activities or through homework tasks designed to provide opportunities for deliberate practice. Everything they do is demonstrating their learning in some way and is being assessed in some way too. But how we assess at Key Stage 3 needs careful consideration, and I know some of my Twitter colleagues will be talking about this today. It is not GCSE, and therefore pupils do not need to be assessed using examination papers or GCSE tasks. What we need to consider is why we are assessing, as I think this really helps us to be purposeful in what we do. For me, Key Stage 3 is about building the foundational knowledge for future learning. Therefore, I want to prioritise this and give it the weight it needs. For this reason, I build in timely knowledge quizzes, 
My pupils laugh at me though, because they know quiz is subtext for test. We also want pupils to perfect core skills. So we should assess their ability to use these core skills in a really careful stepped way using focused deliberate practice. For example, here you can see a checkpoint I gave my pupils to see how well they could find literary information in the text with five different opportunities to prove their mastery of the skill. Note checkpoint is also subtext for test. And finally, of course, we want to end with a task that assesses their complete understanding of what it is we've been teaching. Here, for example, whether they can write a what, how, why paragraph. However, because we are looking to support pupils in building their foundational knowledge or learning, how we structure this is key. Providing scaffolds initially, and, um, which we look to withdraw over time, helps pupils internalize the processes needed for future learning. And yet introducing a challenging task to capture the more able pupils and enable them to demonstrate greater independence is a really easy thing to utilize. But what is more important is how pupils use their assessment feedback to improve themselves as learners. Once pupils have completed a knowledge test for me, I mark these and return them to them. Using their green pen, pupils must self-correct or complete any incorrect answers using the knowledge organiser they have. They ha then have to go back to their knowledge organiser and rag their knowledge and understanding. They identify the knowledge they are secure in and the knowledge they are not yet secure in to frame what they need to study more. Pupils then use Quizlet to create flashcards in these key, are key areas and test themselves before sitting a new knowledge test the following term. Pupils are always surprised when I give them the questions that will feature in a knowledge test ahead of the test. They somehow think they are cheating the teacher. However, what they don't realise is that in providing them with the questions, we are foregrounding the knowledge we want them to revise, knowing that they will revise the right things and be ready for their future learning. Completing the second knowledge test in January was an absolute thing of joy. Having focused in on key areas that needed to be studied and retained, pupils performed exceptionally well, and it really was delightful to see their genuine, joyful responses to their achievements and know that I felt they were acquiring the necessary knowledge. In terms of longer writing tasks or reading responses, it's important that we are clear on how well they have done and what they need to do to improve. I use marking grids with pupil-friendly criterion. These criteria should be of no surprise to pupils because they should have been embedded throughout the unit in my big questions. I use the marking grid to highlight in green what pupils have done well and in pink their area of focus. I also use a box at the bottom to identify what pupils have, have done well, and this is always going to be longer than identifying the next steps for the pupil. The next step should be actionable and appropriate to improving the learner. And what I think is really interesting here is that during our DIRT lesson, as I've been talking, the pupils noted down what that feedback means to her. Finally, I love the use of target stickers on the front of a book, especially when report writing comes around, it has to be said. Pupils complete a sticker once they have had their assessment returned to identify their current level, but also their current target for reading or writing. Reference to these targets are made throughout the next unit. For example, I might say something like, and when you complete this piece of writing, go back to your key target. They also are written at the top of the next assessment to remind pupils that this is an area that they need to focus on. One thing that has really interested me recently, though, is the introduction of a warm write uh, to assess pupils' retention of learning. The Talk for Writing programme states that a cold write is when pupils complete a writing task ahead of a writing unit to see what they can do without any input. The opposite of this is the hot write, which comes after teacher input, instruction, the invention stages, when in fact pupils have been taught how to construct a particular written text. I decided I wanted to introduce a warm write. This is when a period of time has elapsed since the writing of the hot write. And I wanted to introduce this to see how much my pupils could retain from the unit. So 10 weeks after having studied mythology, pupils were given two tasks to complete. A short retention activity you can see on the screen in which they had to brain dump, as Carolyn Spalding calls it, everything they could remember about good narrative writing. After having done this, pupils were given a new picture stimulus and asked to construct a short narrative, drawing upon all that they could remember. It was really interesting, again, to not only see what was and what was not retained, but also how well they could implement their knowledge into their writing to construct a highly skilled narrative. 
Having this information means I can plan accordingly in terms of fronting certain things more strongly within the mythology unit in future, but also returning to some of these things as we head into the next writing unit, for example, paragraph lens. So as I come to the end of my talk, I'd like to return to the Ofsted framework of 2021 in the hope that I've talked through how we have here in Rome worked to ensure that our key stage three curriculum is ambitious and demanding, that it gives pupils the knowledge they need to succeed in life, that it is coherently planned and sequenced towards cumulative sufficient knowledge and skills for future learning, that it helps pupils to remember and integrate new knowledge into larger ideas, that it uses assessment well to help pupils embed this knowledge and to check their understanding and inform our teaching, and that it prioritizes reading. I know events like this are great for book suggestions, so I'd also like to suggest my um, suggested reading, suggest my suggested reading. Symbiosis is by far the best book I've read in curriculum on a general level across all subjects. David Dedale's book on uh, an English curriculum, English curriculum is exceptional. I haven't read it yet, but I'm super excited to read The Trouble with English and how to address it. And finally, when thinking about how to assess knowledge, skills and conceptual understanding, the Research Egg Guide to Assessment is cracking. That is it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry about the PowerPoint format. Thank you so much, Freya. What a start and buzzing. <laughs> so many notes from that. Um, I loved your concept approach and how you thought about uh, returning to those key concepts across the curriculum plan. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting to, to hear that and such a useful presentation for people when they're thinking about planning their curriculum. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think one of my key takeaways as well was uh, your your bit about your question of how well are people actually retaining our teaching, and I, I really liked how you thought about and considered that in relation to writing specifically. Um, so thinking about the writing across the curriculum, how well are students actually um, retaining that key knowledge for writing? Um, could I just would you mind just answering a, a few questions? I'm just okay. looking to be more about how that works. I mean, you spoke about the cold light, the warm light, and the hot light. Um, how is that different? So, do you start um, each writing block with a, with a cold sort of assessment to, to see where they are and what they're taking to write? So the cold right um, is something that I haven't embedded as much, to be honest with you. So the cold right is something that you set just you know, one lesson before you start teaching your unit to see what they can actually do by themselves. I guess with the idea being that you then um, have an idea of, of where to pick that up potentially. Um, the hot right is obviously something that we're all familiar with in terms of once we've taught a unit and once we've taught particular skills, particular knowledge, um, components that they then do a piece of writing based upon what they've learned. The warm right for me, I think, is the really interesting one because we we can again say that we've taught a particular form of writing or we've taught them particular uh, unit units of knowledge with regard to narrative structure, for example. But actually, have they have they really embedded that in terms of their long term memory to be able to utilise that in the future in later years or at GCSE or IB? So it's really, really interesting to give that period of space, I think, between finishing a unit and then coming back to it um, to see how much they can remember. But obviously also uh, along with that, really, it, it kind of strengthens their, their storage strength in terms of bringing that back to their memory so that hopefully in future they can the, draw upon that easily again. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the things that really want to do is um, thinking about like looking at curriculum on a more granular level um, and, and looking at writing on, on, on a more granular level as well. And I think it, that is really important, isn't it? Because we don't want to just, you know, teach writing to describe and, uh, you know, and, and, and look at everything in a, on a, in a superficial way. And that so therefore the students aren't actually remembering that when they, you know, when they return to that um, in, in the next sort of teaching block or cycle. Um, and that does seem to be a, a key thread that's running through several of the presentations today, actually sort of streamlining it and thinking, you know, what specifically are we teaching in this block? What is the core knowledge, um, for, you know, for, for writing that we're going to look at here and, and, and where is that going to be revisited? So that was really useful to, to hear. Thank you so much for that, Freya. Um, 
I think I think that's a really important thing. We've been thinking a lot about it here in Rome in the sense of we're doing a lot of work on censuses. So we're all super excited to hear from Kate next uh, because we're starting to think about, you know, which sentences or which sentence structures are we going to use uh, and introduce to our pupils and when so that we can layer that up over time because that obviously has a huge impact on, on overall quality of writing. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was a, a fabulous keynote presentation for you and, and just thanks once again from the, the TM English Icon team for giving up your time and for being with us this morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much and I'm so looking forward to everyone else. Yeah, I'm sure the conversation will continue on Twitter. Thank you very see much. You there. Yeah, ask fire questions away and I'll see you all on Twitter and I'm going to obviously stay and make lots of notes and share what my thinking is. <laughs> Have a great day. See you later. Right. Um, thank you again so much, Freya, um, for that. I think for me, Freya is one of the most supportive and kind voices when it comes to Edu Twitter, as well as being so extensively knowledgeable and obviously having that experience and wisdom as well. So personally, I've been really grateful for her kind of contributions and collaboration. Um, over the years. I especially liked as well that idea of that warm write um, because I think it really shows us the ability to kind of bring retrieval outside of just the basic retrieval of facts. So not just the kind of multiple choice questions and those quizzes, but going beyond that for different applications of retrieval. So thank you so much, Freya. Um, in terms of our next presentation, then we've got Rosie Giorgio coming up next. Um, Rosie um, is currently studying for a PhD in creative writing and also runs a creative writing workshop. So we're really, really grateful that she's going to be here this morning um, to share with us some of that expertise when it comes to thinking about how we use creative writing and creative thinking along with that um, within the Key Stage 3 classroom. Um, we have got a few minutes, I think, before Rosie. Sarah, have we got time for a, a few minutes for people to quickly bob off and get a drink or is Rosie ready? I think Rosie's ready to go. Oh. <laughs> She's joining us now. There we go. Morning. Morning, Rosie. Morning, Rosie. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, you're all set, ready to go. It's always the bit that everybody dreads getting this <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Fab, thank you so much. Um, can I just check? Do I just click the arrows to get the slides to push through? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, fab. Um, thank you. Okay, so hello, my name is Rosie. Um, you can find me at Edu Feminist. I've packed a lot into the talk, so if you've got any questions, please do tweet them at me. Um, it will it will move quite quickly. So today I'm talking about the power of creative thinking and writing in the Key Stage 3 curriculum. Um, and this is something that I'm really passionate about. And in some ways, I wonder if I, the talk that I have come up with, the title for it, I don't know if it was misleading at all um because really what i'm interested in is stories and the power of stories um one of my favorite things is this idea that the universe is made up of stories not atoms and that our lineage is passed down through oral tradition things like that um in the research that i'm doing i'm looking at the way in which stories can change the course of history particularly the idea that stories tapping into movements, political movements, literary movements, will shape the world that we're living in in the future. And um, Professor Francesca Paletta put it better than I ever could. She said that stories get us to pay attention to the issue. They get us to care about the issue, get us to participate in a social movement, to act on behalf of causes that may once have seemed remote. And stories can lead us to change our own behaviour. And that essentially is what I want to talk about. How do we get to talking about good story writing, writing good stories, because it makes us better humans and it will make the world a better place. Of course, we're English teachers and the technical side is really important. So I've paired that sort of philosophy with the nuts and bolts of story writing today, which is what I'm going to be moving on to talking about. Bennett Clark and Motion and Naidu in 2008 wrote an article that says creative writing is the study of writing. This includes poetry, fiction, drama and creative nonfiction and its context through creative production. And 
the reflection on process. It is that reflection on process that I think really benefits us as English teachers. And in it was really joyful to listen to Freya talking because I think we're echoing one another in that story writing is metacognitive because you write your story and then you reflect on the process. And quite often the creative work is paired with a critical component, um, especially at A-level. So as we move towards that, it would be nice to set those foundational blocks in place at key stage three. So, you know, in terms of impact, what is it good for? We know that there is the creative element at key stage four with paper one, question five. And essentially, we are always taking the students on a journey. But outside of that remit, story writing and creative writing particularly are really good and useful for the development of grammar, vocab, phonology and discourse. So the Creative Arts Council ran a programme in 2015, I believe, um, where they looked at the impact of some programmes for story writing specifically in Key Stage 3. And they found that the creative writing process aids in the following way. Um, oh, I'm really sorry about the formatting of that. That should not be there. <laughs> I will get rid of that before I put that online for you. Um, so what they found in that process when they were doing their write-up, they got an independent review, is that young people and teachers valued the writing for pleasure it gave rather than just the product and that it was really useful for students to reflect. They became more confident as people. So the process of story writing actually bolsters the human, the whole child, which I think is really beautiful. So there's a poetry in that. Some of the words that the students were asked in that study were, what do you associate with good writing and good writers? And these were the things that they said. They said, you know, writers are creative, they're imaginative, they're confident, they're passionate, they're amazing, they're interesting. And these are all the things that we want our students to feel about themselves. So it was really nice for them to be able to kind of follow through that process and reach that conclusion where they see themselves as writers and they start to apply these words to themselves. Um, I've put a crown on here because I have a lot of respect for Sir Ken Robinson. And he, in 2006, gave his famous TED Talk. He believes that creativity now in education should be as important as literacy. And really, that is the premise that this is this leans on, that this is kind of it focuses on. The problem with creativity in education for lots of us is that there are myths surrounding creativity and creative writing. The idea that we are not, some teachers might feel they are not expert enough, students might feel that they're not expert enough. The confidence of the teacher often impacts the way that they feel they can deliver things, the experiences that they have had. And then there's this sense of how do you assess creativity? Yes, we can assess the product, but this is something what value do you place on it? Um, and in the end, Sir Kim Robinson sort of says, he doesn't sort of say it actually, he says very certainly, we end up educating these children out of being as creative as they were when they joined us. You know, young children especially, they take a chance. If they don't know, they'll have a go. He says, am I right? They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, being wrong and being creative, they are not the same thing. And of course, it's really important to acknowledge that. However, if you are not prepared to be wrong, you're not going to try something that you haven't tried before. And it's the process of trying the thing that you haven't tried before that leads to these creative outputs. So by the time we get to adulthood or late adolescence, he argues that we we we're scared of mistakes. They're stigmatized that our process the systems that we run in schools, they make be, you know, they make mistakes um, feel punitive. So we're educating people out of their creative capacities. I would like to think that that is not universally true. And that certainly that's something we don't all want to do. But um, that's kind of where this comes from. So I looked at how can we foster creativity? It's something I try really hard to do in my own classroom and I'm sure that you will do as well. One of my favourite, favourite quotations or passages is from David Armand and he says, be brave, just do it, just write. 
Like it's that simple. Um, we're imperfect beings in an imperfect world. Be imperfect, be messy, make mistakes. And although I'm being flippant, I think that there is actually something really substantial in what he is saying. We need to move away from the culture where making mistakes is something to be scared of. It's something that we should celebrate because we are all trying new things. And once we have established that culture of creativity, that mistake making is beautiful and messy and fun and good can come of it, um, that there are no bad consequences for making mistakes, the, the art comes. Um, and these are the things that I think are useful strategies for that. So when I'm thinking about creativity, I think that we work in two ways as people. We work really well when we are working without limits and we have blue sky thinking caps on um, and we feel free. We feel kind of infinite and vast. And some of the creative practices that we can do to promote that feeling are here. And I will go into them in just a moment. On the reverse of that, this idea of making mess kind of lends itself to rule breaking. So on the other side of the coin, we have really, really strict limits and working within those limitations, the limitations of the form and the genre, which also lend themselves to huge creative outputs. So things that could be useful for your key stage three students, journaling, and journals are something that students can write in at home and at school. They do not have to be something that you read, but they are welcome to share that with you. Of course, the nature of journaling means that students do share some personal information. So with that, it's important to make clear that anything that you read that could be of concern, you would have to follow those safeguarding procedures. And sometimes they do come up. Um, and free writing falls under that remit, actually. So I'll skip ahead and then I'll come back. Um, free writing is the process where you give students a set of time. Five minutes works really well for students that haven't done this before. They can write about absolutely anything. And the idea is they write for the full five minutes, they put pen to paper and they don't stop. That is the key. They don't stop. They always move forward. They don't correct any of their mistakes. They're not to worry about perfection. They're to enjoy the process. They can write about what's in their mind. If they think that they can't think of anything, I encourage them to write. I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything until something comes. And inevitably it does. It might be about lunch. It might be about the homework they haven't done. It might be about a football match they're really excited about. But it's a it's getting pen to paper in a non-threatening way because it feels um, feels personal and powerful to them. So it's move forward, don't correct your mistakes. The point at which you might correct mistakes is if something comes up in that free writing process where they want to take it into a more formal sphere. If that's going to inform a piece of poetry or fiction, then poetry and fiction genres, they have their own conventions. So we would then want to adhere to those, but that becomes a more formal process. So this is about the, those initial stages and it does work really well. I agree, it does work really, really well. Um, I need to go back because I've skipped ahead. The other part of that that's kind of the, the limitless, infinite aspect of creative writing is reflecting on the process. Asking them questions like, what does creativity look like to you? Where does creativity come from? Can creativity be measured? They're really interesting questions. They generate such fantastic responses from the students. And it, I think it encourages them to think of the whole creative self. English very much is a part of that. But where else are they creative? Do they do music? Do they create visual pieces of art, drama, theatre? And how do those inform their, their identity in the English classroom? Um, the questions that I'm actually most interested in, that I'm trying to warm them up to, is when do you feel most creative? How do you know you're being creative at that time? What tools do you need to be creative? And 
what environment do you need to be creative? It is such a personal thing. And classrooms are very practical, open spaces. Sometimes it helps for the students to think about what is my creativity toolkit? Where am I going to get the most out of my creative self? Maybe I will work on quite a lot of my creative stuff at home in private and I will bring what I am happy to share to class which is what most artists and writers do it can be quite an isolating experience when you're doing it professionally people quite often write on their own and then come back to writing groups so I think trying to work that model into our key stage three classroom is really really helpful however of course there are the practicalities of being teachers and the fact that we do work in schools and we have a curriculum to deliver. So with that said, there are these working within limits strategies that also work really well in my experience. And I will share the resources with you. I will put them through on Twitter. And for the purposes of this talk, I've set up a blog. So I will put my resources on the blog where it's all in one place and it's easy for you to find. So I'll go through them one by one. I like to give them a character generator. And the thing that works really well with this is it takes their choices away because you give them really limited things to choose from. So you say to them, pick a gender, whether that is male, female, gender neutral, gender fluid, pick a, an identity. And then you give them some ages that they have to pick from. So they can't choose from anything. They have to pick from what you've given them. Five things in their pocket. Now tell me how their hands look. Now tell me how their feet look. What are they looking at right now? What are they doing right now in your mind's eye? Takes about three minutes before you know it. They have not exactly fully fleshed characters, but they have a fairly good idea of what this character is like because the way that your hands look and the things you carry in your pocket on your person all day long, they're very telling and it takes a lot of skill to do that. Um, I've just seen the time, so I'm going to whiz through and I'm happy to take any more questions later. This has covered up something that was on my slide because I had an animation, um, but this is a simile generator. And the way that it works is I give students a list of abstract nouns and concrete nouns. Quite often, I will cut them out and put them in an envelope and I will say, right, look at yours. They're totally random and they need to create a simile. Um, this is something that I did share on Twitter, so it might already be familiar to you. Essentially, something like, um, pain is like a butterfly it doesn't stay around for long so they create similes and they need to be able to justify how they've paired the two and the challenge of course is that you've given them the concrete noun and the abstract noun now I've chosen these things very deliberately because the piece of writing that we were doing for one of them was set at war the other one was set as a, at a fairground I think it's quite clear <laughs> which category uh, fits which word. So you can do that for them. Then you kind of end up creating the semantic field for them. Um, and their writing becomes immediately sophisticated because they've generated this group of, they've put these group of words together without really having to think too much about the concrete nouns. So that really helps. Story cubes you might be familiar with. You can buy them on Amazon uh, or in your local bookshop. It's, it's a pack of nine cubes. You roll them. It will give nine images. Um, there'll be objects, places or characters. And the students have to create a narrative or a poem based on that. And I often pair this with a free writing exercise, particularly for my low ability groups who feel that free writing is too scary or too open. I'll roll the story cubes or a student can roll the story cubes. They really love that. And then we write down what they are on the board and they get five minutes to create something that ties all of these strange, unusual objects together. Finally, genre constraints. Um, I will teach them propping character archetypes so we're talking about the typical fairy tale. And then I'll either get them to create a cast of fairy tale characters or to subvert them. So for this lesson, we looked at an, um, a very short part of Shrek and they really liked that. So the propian character archetypes are on the image behind this one, but it will come up on the PowerPoint later on. Finally, uh, just to say thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You can ask me any questions um, through Twitter. It'd be lovely to hear from you. Thank you so much, Rosie. That was brilliant. Thank you. Uh, your passion just absolutely shines through. And it was a really inspiring talk, reminding us that Key Stage 3 is the time to actually make use of the, the, the kind of 
the freedom that we have in that key stage um, in order to inspire your creativity. And I love the, the practical strategies that you've suggested there for, for helping us to do that. Um, in, in particular, the, the character generator, I really like the simile generator as well, and also your, um, your strategy of, of free writing. Um, I, I just have one quick question, actually, if we just feed that through, and it's from Penny, who's been, um, who's watching at home, and, and Penny's picking up on the, on the idea of free writing, and she asks, um, do you do anything with the free writing when it's finished? Would you read that, or is that just sort of private for the student? It's, it's at the student's discretion. And I think that's how you get the best out of them because it's such a personal thing. And essentially it becomes a stream of consciousness. Now, something that I do um, that I have had to get myself comfortable with is I do my free writing on the board. So while the students are writing in their journals, I'm typing away and it's being projected and they can see me thinking I can hear a noise outside of the window or a bird has flown by, or I remember I didn't get my photocopying. And they see me as a human being and I, I suppose that really helps my relationships with the students. Um, so I always share mine and I do make it very clear to them. I would never ask them to do something I'm not prepared to do myself. Yeah. Um, because when the, you know, when you're dabbling the creative process and it's so intrinsically personal, we feel that it is, um, I think it's important to do, it creates trust. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for giving up your time and, and sharing your, your knowledge with us this morning. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Okay, up next is Donald Hale. And Donald is going to be talking to us about assessment at Key Stage 3, um, specifically how he's been redesigning the assessment format um, and procedures at Key Stage 3. So. We'll just check that he's with us. Ah, oh, there we are. <laughs> morning, Donald. Good morning. And your slides are ready to go. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Can I just check that? Perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Right. Yeah, um, cheers. Um, so I'm Donald Heal. Um, I tweet at Heal Donald. And as Sarah Ratley says, I'm going to talk to you about rethinking assessment at Key Stage 3 which has sort of obsessed my thoughts really over the last three or four years in particular, but I think it's always an ongoing discussion that happens a lot within English departments. So I suppose I wanna frame my presentation with this kind of assertion, really. What I'm gonna to purport to you is that far too often, assessment practices at Key Stage 3 do not directly assess specific knowledge taught in the curriculum. And that is a problem. I think it's a huge problem when that occurs. And if we think back to Freya's keynote speech from earlier, this idea of having such a carefully sequenced, knowledge-rich curriculum is so, so important. But for me, what often is the disconnect is that effort and thinking process that goes into curriculum in terms of content taught doesn't always marry up with how we assess our students at Key Stage 3 to ensure that they've secured or mastered that curricular knowledge. So what I'm going to talk you through today really is a model that might help to address that. It is very illustrative. It is quite a reduced version of what I would do, but it is going to hopefully just give you an insight into the thinking process that underpins what I think is a really important aspect of Key Stage 3 assessment. So the example I'm going to draw from is the idea of a metaphor as a threshold concept within the discipline of English. And obviously if we're thinking about metaphor as such an integral part of the discipline of our subject, then it's really important that we carefully consider the sequencing of when and how this is taught to students. And I think all of us do that. I think particularly since the loss of levels and particularly with the new Ofsted framework with its focus on curriculum, I think as a profession, we are much more inclined to think about curriculum in more intelligent ways than perhaps we did when I first trained kind of 11, 12 years ago. So most of us will, I would argue, specify and teach this at various stages of learning in some form of curricular mapping at Key Stage 3. And obviously there's different versions and mediums in which you can do that curricular mapping. But we might perhaps do it something like this. We might consider kind of when and where it appears within our curriculum across one year or possibly even two years or three years. 
So I've used the example of metaphor here, looking at a piece of curricular mapping that I've done for a recent presentation for my new school that I'm beginning in, in September. And what I was really keen to kind of explore is the idea that if metaphor is that threshold concept, where and when does it take place in our curriculum? And also how we can build greater knowledge of that concept within English over time. So if, for example, we began the year by looking at the novel Cirque du Freak by Darren Chan and some Gothic writing alongside that, perhaps, we might initially introduce year sevens to metaphors within the Gothic genre, if that happened to be the unit that you began the year with. And what I would say is a really useful way to introduce metaphor initially in a knowledge-rich fashion is to actually look at the parts of metaphor and what kind of is the process to construct metaphors. So I talk a lot about the kind of use of tenor and vehicle. As we then might progress through that year and we move on to term two topic, which is the autobiographical piece of writing, I am Malala, we might teach metaphor again. And we obviously will revisit and recap the use of tenor and vehicle, because I think it's really important that we keep revisiting learning to secure that and master that. And then we might also introduce the idea of grant and how that works, the relationship between tenor and metaphor to try to develop that literary analysis. We might even zoom in on a specific example that you can see on the screen. As we then develop in our curriculum mapping by term three, we might end up teaching Romeo and Juliet, for instance. And then we might actually try to take it to the next level, maybe the teaching of conceit as a form of metaphor. So obviously what's occurred there throughout that year is that metaphor was first taught in terms of its parts of metaphor, its kind of basic construction. It was then developed into literary analysis by term two. And then by the end of the year, it's looking at metaphor in a more interesting way. So for example, there's a comparison of Juliet to a boat that is a really useful conceit if you're ever studying Romeo and Juliet to explore. And then we might take that further going into year eight, looking at the verse novel, Long Way Down, and looking at the conceit of the elevator, for example, in that. And this slide very much kind of illustrative it's not the kind of full picture. If I had a much bigger slide, you'd kind of see how that would develop through all of year eight and then develop all of year nine. And then even into 10 and 11, arguably even 12 and 13, if you were inclined to, to take that further. But this is what, to me, what a knowledge rich curriculum looks like. But what I want to show you next with this, and I'm kind of using this as the setup for how we would assess students and their knowledge and understanding of metaphor, is that we cannot afford to not assess this effectively and ensure that students do understand that. Because if they struggle with metaphor in term one of year seven with Cirque du Freak, for example, then we can't really expect them by year eight long way down to understand the conceit of the metaphor. So it's all about that process over time. So what I wanna kind of explore is that if we do have a knowledge rich curriculum in that sense with that illustrative example, then this term that's obviously come up a lot um, in recent years, the idea of curriculum as the progression model that Christine Council talks about a lot. And you can see here, I've cited uh, Michael Fordham and Stephen Rowlett and their thoughts on it. But if we design a curriculum in that way that I've just illustrated, then actually we've also designed indirectly our assessment of that curriculum. Because this is why the curriculum is the progression model, according to Michael Fordham. If a student has learned the curriculum, they've made progress. And we've lived in this vacuum in the, in the UK with the loss of levels several years ago with Key Stage 3 in terms of how we assess our students. And there's been a lot of kind of talk about flight paths that map to GCSE and kind of, you know, um, criteria-based descriptors or age-related expectations and things like that. And I think actually what I'm going to argue is that the curriculum itself is how you assess the students, because if they know your curriculum that you've carefully designed, then they're making progress. And Stephen Rowlett talks about this idea as well. He talks about that if you need people to know that specific thing at that specific time, then make that the focus of your assessment, not some convoluted system of generic descriptors and criteria, which of course we're all subject to and a slave to a little bit at GCSE to a certain extent. But if we've got that freedom of key stage three assessment where we get to design that, then I think this approach of curriculum as the progression model is so, so important. But what Rowlett says is that it requires us to have a keener understanding of the granular components of the curriculum and awareness of how they build together into the co composites of knowledge and skills. 
And it's that granular component that I want to explore with my example of that curriculum mapping and how that would lead to a natural form of assessment at Key Stage 3. I'm all about the granular. David Dido kind of talks about how you would do this by creating what he terms kind of curriculum related expectations. And I recommend that you read the blog. In fact, it's a series of blog that David Dido wrote on curriculum related expectations to kind of look at this further. But what he says in that blog is that if we are using curriculum as the progression model, then that simply means that we make judgments of progress based on how much of the curriculum a ch a children have learned, a child has learned, I should say. So if we've got curriculum related expectations, that should help us to specify, teach. And that's what I've shown you with that example earlier of that curricular mapping across year seven and eight. But it should also assess the knowledge that we expect children to acquire. And it becomes reasonable to expect that all students have met those expectations because they are or they should be directly connected to what has been taught. I suppose I see a lot of teachers and departments talk about having a knowledge rich curriculum, but I rarely see um, being assessed in that knowledge rich way. And actually what happens is key stage three students are too often left to flounder in assessment practices that just sort of rely on genericism. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So often what we might do, for example, if I go back to the year seven example of I am Malala, we might get to the end of that unit and then we might set a kind of typical kind of essay based question. So it might be, for example, how does Malala present ideas of rebellion in this passage? We might make it an extract based question. It might even have a generic mark scheme, not dissimilar to GCSE. It might be more student friendly. It might be written in house by departments. But essentially an assessment like that, you're merely just hoping that students display the knowledge of metaphor that you probably spent a long time in your lessons teaching them and highlighting the importance. So if you want to assess that all your students and all your classes in your curriculum have actually understood metaphor in the way that you like to teach it, then it needs to be something like this. I would recommend that we do this instead. So looking at the granular components, so looking at an example of metaphor within that passage from I am Malala, looking at things like tenor, vehicle, grant, and using that to build the ideas of how we develop literary analysis, but actually being able to assess them directly in what's been taught also offers the opportunity really to then actually give a feedback that matters. So if you recognize that a student, for example, can recognize tenor, but not the vehicle, well, they're not going to develop decent literary analysis, but actually capturing that data through this form of assessment means that you can do reteaching and responsive teaching to develop the needs for your learners, as opposed to setting that assessment on the previous slide. And then they might not even mention metaphor and they might still get decent marks. They might write a decent essay. But what was the point then in teaching metaphor in the way that you did in your curriculum if you've not directly assessed that? And I suppose that's what I mean by those cur uh, curriculum related expectations. So just as a, a quick reflection then, because I think my time has run out, I want you to kind of go away from what I've said there. And obviously do feel free to tweet me and I'll probably blog about this as well to discuss it further. But think really carefully, do your assessment practices actually assess specific knowledge taught in your curriculum? And if not, what do you need to change in your department? I'm not saying that you should teach what I've just talked about in this presentation, but how that works for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Donald. I think in terms of like the idea of assessing the granular is a really helpful way of us rethinking maybe older styles of assessment. So I know like if I think back to the old APP style, actually there were some huge issues with that in terms of actually you're trying to assess a broad range of skills rather than diagnosing some of the things that you might want to reteach. And again, a, a bit of an issue maybe with some of the off-the-shelf standardized assessments and GCSC styles bits as well so i think thank you for those like practical examples but also some of the prompts that you've given us and um, to go away and rethink our key stage three assessment um, criteria as well um next up then i'm, I'm very aware of time because i think we're running a tiny bit over um we have elaine elaine is a head of department um, and she's going to be introducing us to some ideas around silence and protest within a year eight curriculum which i think is really important for us especially at the moment if we think about helping our students to generate their own voice um, and then apply that to the world around them. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass on to Elaine.
Sorry, Elaine, you're actually on mute. I am. Oh my God. Go. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? That's perfect. Yeah, yeah we'll let you I'm, so I'm so nervous. I just... <laughs> no, your presentation right, okay. is fantastic. Right, I'll, I'll let you crack on. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. So my name's Elaine, um, and I'm going to be speaking about how we reviewed our Key Stage 3 curriculum with a specific focus on Year 8. Um, so obviously, I can only give you a really brief overview, but I hope that you do find something useful for your context. Um, I'm going to start with the word diversity, and I am really nervous um, about this bit, and I'm happy to be corrected if I don't express myself well. Um, but Benny Cara writes about the thorny nature of diversity as a term. And although I knew I had to do better with the text we teach, which is one of the reasons for that curriculum overhaul, I really did feel a bit out of my depth. Um, and I really didn't want a unit of work that drew attention to itself as diverse. And I came across um, Chris Curtis's blog. Um, it, had a, it had a really profound impact on me. And he has this to say about diversity. We should talk about it, we should explore it, but please don't view it as a tick box exercise. So I felt that that was a really great place to start. And I do recognise that what we choose to teach has consequences. Um, readers who encounter the literary canon from a position of deficit or um, always as an antagonist, if they're always embodied as an antagonist, not only find themselves excluded from the canon, but experience in Dr. Amberine Dadaboy's words, harm from the canon's fire. So diversity includes many different experiences, versions, truths, stories and worlds and we all start from different places and have different stories. Stories can heal or harm. We should treat the stories of all people with respect. So with these ideas in mind I'm just going to talk briefly about the process we went through and how we tried to maybe encourage students to be more diverse in their thinking rather than just serve diversity up to them as a bolt-on lesson. Um, and so this is what we did. We began by asking a series of questions um, of our existing curriculum. And it was really interesting listening to Freya, actually, um, and I felt, felt uh, her keynote was really reassuring in light of what we've done. So we asked those questions of our existing curriculum, and the answers to those questions helped, helped us understand um, that we had to agree on foundational knowledge, concept, disciplinary intentions, the things that underpin our subject, and then decide which text to keep and which to add. Um, and we tried to select from a range of texts that were um, inclusive and representative. Um, those questions are ones that I got from a CPD event that I attended run by Jennifer Webb. Um, and we put them in the grid and gradually over a series of department meetings, we kind of added our notes and recorded our discussions. So the Key Stage 3 curriculum is still um, evolving, but I'd like to show you Year 8. Um, so this is our Year 8 curriculum. All the texts are connected by the theme of powerful voices. And with all our texts, we are continuously asking, where are we positioned in relation to this text? Whose voice and whose speech is given value and legitimacy? What happens when we erase someone's voice, their language, their culture? And who gets to tell a story and whose version of that story is correct? Um, and a text that I found really helpful uh, when thinking about the curriculum was Anthony Cockerell's rationale for a thematic curriculum. So I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about two of those units um, and make a link back to my earlier points about diversity. <coughs> Excuse me. So we teach The Tempest um, and I was increasingly unhappy with our approach which seemed to place Caliban at best as Prospero's victim um, and where we're either invited to pity Caliban or accept Prospero's view of him um, as, a, as a sort of demi-devil. I didn't want to just chuck out a really great text that I love, even though that I was aware that Prospero's perspective very much shapes how we see Caliban. Um, and just replacing The Tempest with, in Chris Curtis's words, um, an easy fit unit of work that addresses diversity just seemed wrong. So I wanted to keep it um, for lots of reasons. Um, it's connected to other texts we teach, it delivers our disciplinary intentions, but I was uncomfortable. And it was after attending the Globe's anti-racist Shakespeare on The Tempest that I became interested in the way that Caliban can be a focus for discussion about race and colonial structures. 
And I started to see that if we look at Caliban from a First Nation perspective, then the version of Caliban, who is a monster, becomes entirely the construct of the European characters who are looking. He appears strange simply because he does not present as a white European body and in fact has his own culture, language and identity, which existed long before the arrival of the island invaders. So exploring these ideas means we look at Caliban through the lens of Inuit people from, uh, and uh, the colonization of North America. And we also look at contemporary travel accounts from both North and South America. When we teach this, we start with Caliban's story um, before he is positioned as a victim, rather than looking through the eyes of the colonizer and we consider the many both positive and negative ways of seeing Caliban. Now, I'm really conscious that when I'm saying this, this all sounds really serious, but in many ways, our teaching of the play is pretty conventional. Um, we do really have fun with the language, the characters and the stagecraft, but guiding the scheme of work are three key questions. We ask, what would happen if Caliban got his language back? His language is erased, uh, Miranda dismisses it as gabble. We ask, what if Caliban has his own indigenous culture? And that's where I think considering Caliban as a Native American is really interesting. Um, it's really good to know about actually the voyages uh, of Martin Frobisher in the late 16th century and his encounters with native people, and particularly the account of three Inuit people who were captured, taken, and then exhibited in England in 1577. And then we look at the way Caliban has been represented on stage. And we ask, what if the actor playing Caliban is the most beautiful person available? Because if the actor playing Caliban is the most beautiful, and I do appreciate as well that, that most beautiful is a particularly loaded term, but then the version of Caliban that is a monstrosity becomes entirely the construct of the European characters who are looking. <clears throat> and suddenly, the limited understanding of the island invaders is foregrounded. Um, it's Alonso who says at the end of the play, this is a strange thing, the air I looked on. But well, what if looking is the problem, or the person doing the looking, not who or what is looked at? And for me, this is really crucial we might teach all sorts of texts, but do we perpetuate inequalities of power because of how we position ourselves in relation to the texts and the characters and events in them? So one of the things we realised when we were discussing curricular change was that we had to really uh, put our disciplinary intentions front and centre, then identify the text that would best uh, enact them. And the text obviously had to have literary and academic uh, merit. And we felt that the best uh, vehicle to deliver the knowledge and skills for poetry was the uh, poetry of Raymond Antrobus and Christine Sun Kim. Um, it's amazing. Um, they're both extraordinarily talented and unique artists. I love teaching this unit. Their work is off the scale. Um, and uh, because representation is important, as deaf artists, they demand that we question how we interact with language and with poetry. Um, just to be aware that when I'm using the word deaf, I'm using it with a capital D because both these artists were born deaf. So Antropus insists that deafness is an experience, not a trauma, and he absolutely refuses to allow the reader to feel sorry for him or to position him as a victim. Um, and uh, Christine Sun Kim is just extraordinary. She's an extraordinary sound artist and poet, um, and we look particularly at her work around closed captions, which a deaf slash deaf person um, relies on when watching TV. And she asks who gets to decide what those captions should say, and she rewrites them and then um, looks at those poetic possibilities of closed captions. Honestly, the work students produce around these two artists is, is amazing. Um, and I just, I love teaching this unit so much. Um, and I really want to stress that we're not looking at disability in the teaching of these poets. And we're really, really not looking at their work to make um, hearing people understand what it is like to be deaf. Um, Antrobus himself says that he has no conscious interest in, in educating a hearing audience. We just teach them because they're incredible. They're part of a range of voices that are 
in Benny Cara's voice, uh, be sorry, Benny Cara's words, embedded everyday usual within a year eight curriculum that has as its unifying theme, powerful voices. So some final thoughts. I hope I've given you some ideas for questions you might ask to initiate curricular change, some ideas for texts, and maybe a way to focus on those texts, and something to think about in terms of diversity. Um, I really don't think I've got this nailed down, um, and in particularly in reference to the teaching of race, belonging, migration, and empire in relation to English literature, I'm actually now uh, pursuing my own learning with Attraction Fellowship, which is really exciting. So to conclude, this is just a, a really tiny slice of a broader curriculum that includes texts that are diverse and representative, but that are also conventional and traditional. Um, but I passionately believe that they're all uh, just wonderful, they're awesome, they have literary merit, they suit our disciplinary intentions. Through these texts, we invite students to look from their perspective, then look again. We think about the positions we come from and the positions we can't occupy and the questions we might need to ask. We think about the power of voices that might be saying something different to our own. I really, really hope we teach students to interrogate power structures. We do not foreground pity. We do not say feel sorry for people who do not feel sorry for themselves. We don't say look at the problem, the lack of power, the difference to you. We use text to expose students to experiences and points of view, but they have value in and of themselves. They really don't require reframing as victim narratives. Benny Cara's explanation of usualizing diversity is always in my mind. Finally, I wonder if some aspect of diversity lies not in the token text choice or in the compartmentalized topic, but in the way we look. If we don't interrogate that question where we position ourselves as readers, and where characters in the text or even writers are positioned in relation to us, then we may continue to perpetuate paradigms of inequality. We must be careful that we do not do harm in the telling of stories. Okay, that's me done, thank you very much. The final slide is just some things that I loved reading and might be useful uh, for you, there we go. Thank you so much, Elaine, that was a superb presentation. I'm so sorry that you only had 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, there is, there's so much to talk about there, no doubt that conversation will continue on Twitter um, throughout the day, so thank you so much. Um, oh, you're so very welcome. So incredibly useful for departments who are looking to um, diversify their curriculum in a, in a meaningful way, and, and I think the, the, the questions and the ideas that you've posed there certainly provide a, a useful starting point along with the wider reading suggestions too, so thank you so much for that. You're very welcome, thank you, I enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. So up next, we have Stephanie Hammond, who will be talking to us about um, teaching classical civilizations and how doing so can improve um, sophistication of analysis and also creative writing. We'll just see if she's ready to enter the stream. Hi, uh, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I feel, I feel like I've got complete uh, imposter syndrome after listening to all those talks. They're fantastic. Oh, no, not at all. Well, I can see that your PowerPoint's ready to go, so yeah. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So um, mine actually works, uh, ties in quite nicely with Rosie's, uh, the fact about trying something new. Um, so in my school, we adapted or we started to look at classics as a mean of... Um, Stretch and challenge for top set. Our year 11, uh, especially our top set, are incredibly able. And so we started to look at classics and it was a way of improving the literature grades. Um, we did this. It was really successful. It was really fantastic. But then what happened is that we actually, it was really like falling in love with the subject again. Um, and what was so good about it was that all the teachers and staff were putting so much effort into learning about the mythology. We thought, well, we'll just push it down and we'll see what it's like with Key Sage 3. So this is a kind of a, a snapshot of how we use classics and classical civilizations in uh, Key Sage 3. And the view will be that our students do take their classical um, civilizations GCSE as part of their English um, subject. So they'll have three GCSEs from English. So what we do is a starting point or the way we started was, um, and all this is all year seven work. It's a, a way of using um, the AQA prompt, the, the image prompt for creative writing. 
So we use images that we can infer classics from. So it makes it a lot easier for the students. So if um, I just read that out to you. So scarlet lava floods the ground, washing the stench of sin from the chthonic ground. Chthonic air is a word that means it's associated with the under underworld. Tidal waves of ruby and rose and claret scorch the land. Steam hisses constantly as the rocks scream in anguish. Through the glaring distance, through the charcoal mist of invisibility, he stands, Hades looming, ever present, ever knowing he watches. So that's an example of um, a year seven piece of creative writing. And it's, they've just embraced it so much. They absolutely love it. And it's a really nice way of, we have classics as a success criteria. So as you can see there, the success criteria would have been um, color synonyms. It would have been a range of punctuation. We're looking at sentence structure, but classics will always be a success criteria for um, the majority of work that we do. Another one, uh, obviously um, you've got Hades and the Underworld again. So standing guard at those iron gates, the three headed stairs, deadlier than Medusa, more vicious than Ares, swifter than Hermes, Cerberus awaits. So here is someone desperately trying to show off how many uh, Greek references they can make. The past, present and future, the souls of the dead remained locked. Forever trapped, three heads, three throats, like the grinding of tectonic plates, the growl erupted. So a nice little bit of um, geography knowledge there. So when I've shared this in the past, people always go to me, oh, it's a brilliant way. You know, it's very boy friendly. It's a great way of getting boys engaged with English. But um, just a bit into context, I work at a, a girls, all girls school, Islamic faith school. So really, um, the context and the background of our of our students are so far removed from the classical world, you know, kind of you're eaten and you're very elite. We're um, very much in a city, very deprived area. So please never think that that classics is something that is very much unattainable. I've, I've fought quite hard to convince everyone that actually classics isn't just for the top sets. Um, in terms of the specification, it's very much knowledge based. And if your students are able to learn and able to recall, um, they can just use their English skills when it comes to the longer questions. So, yeah, in terms of, you know, taking, as Rosie said, um, trying something new, this really is a fantastic way of adding a little bit of zest into the English curriculum. So this was um, last week, actually. We're doing, um, again, with Year 7, we were doing children's literature. So that's the scheme. We're looking at Black Beauty, and this was the creative writing lesson. So this was the image that we used for creative writing. Just to give you a couple more examples of what everyone was writing, I'll give you time just to read that. So obviously they've been sat there uh, next to a thesaurus, but we we do a quick turn and talk. We do do kind of think, pair and share about how we can embed classics into the image, but it's hardly, um, it's not really the focus of the lesson. The focus of the lesson is still, you know, your traditional creative writing um, skills. So um, sentence starts, simile starts, um, using alliteration, using ambitious vocabulary. So. Please don't think we sit there and kind of turn it into a classic lesson. We don't. We do have a classics lesson once a week. Um, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. But I think this just shows how much the girls want to show, how much they know, they enjoy, and they really take what, well, you know, it's a picture of a horse, to be fair. There's, there's only a certain amount you can do with it. However, by taking the classics, it really takes it to a completely different level. Um, and it's not that difficult to do. They absolutely gobble up the stories it's like um i don't know it is almost as if we're playing an episode of eastenders at sometimes you know that the love lives it's so complex and this connection and this and this and this this person got angry and it, it's so interesting the girls literally lap it up um and then this was um from that same lesson so this was the piece that we tweeted his eye glaring with an incandescent rage and fury auroral blazing beauty filled with cold heartless yeah, an intense passion, a brilliant desire for blood um, emanated wherever it stalked its prey. 
beaming with Aphrodite's beauty and Artemis's call of the wild, but booming with Ares rage. It's Sapphire's eyes illuminating glory. Again, to put it into context, so we had uh, obviously World Book Day on Thursday. Um, and what was absolutely beautiful to see is we had a number of classically uh, classical characters. We had an Aphrodite, we had an Artemis, we had um, a Medusa, um, I think we had a Hera. It was fantastic to see. So I think, it, again, it's just that like trying something new. And this was literally just an experiment with, with um, Top Set Year 11. And it's been so, it's had so much impact that it really has just trickled down. And the, the students, um, I think, are incredibly proud and they realize traditionally what classics is and the fact that they can, um, they can use it and they can access it. It just increases their confidence so, so much. So from another point of view, um, this is English language. So this was a question. Um, it's that Sister Brendan one, you know, the Ofsted one, um, where um, all the children love reading. Um, we use this a lot with year um, nine because it's quite accessible as a GCSE text. It's quite an easy one to do, especially for paper two. So I never thought, I knew that um, classics would work with um, creative writing and I knew and I've got proof that it works with literature, but I never even thought there'd be a connection with language until one girl um, the quotation in the extract about Sister Brendan is, does that make me the queen bee? Ask Sister Brendan with a mischievous glint in her shining eyes. One student, you know when the students write something that you never even thought about, and you're like, oh my goodness, that's incredible, wrote about shining. So she looked at the, um, the, the reference to shining and she made an allusion to Helios. So Helios is the Titan god of the sun. Um, and we call him kind of the all-seeing eye. So what she did was she made the connection between shining, made a classical illusion. We call it, um, the sentence start we use is um, looking through a classical lens. So looking through a classical lens, uh, she made that connection with Helios, the Titan God of the sun. And just as he is the all-seeing eye of the, uh, the world, she is the all-seeing eye of the school. Things like that, it just, as soon as you give them that little bit of classical knowledge, they can go wild with it. They can use it absolutely anywhere. And the way we do it, um, as I said before, is our um, knowledge organizers. So knowledge organizers, I'm not sure how clear that's going to be for you. So knowledge organizers have been a real, um, they've been so significant. Our whole curriculum in English is built on knowledge organizers we have about. 50 um, at the moment and we have a set for classics and what will happen um, so they're dual coded the students have these knowledge organizers we work through them um, we will annotate them and make them quite personal so all students have one of these we'll read through them um, they'll highlight key information we'll maybe add extra bits of information that they annotate onto it so these knowledge organizers are very much personal to um to everyone and for the first three minutes of every lesson, um, they will talk with a partner. They will test each other or some people like to just sit um, and read through it quietly. Some people like to write it out again. Some people use their mini whiteboards and they test themselves. So we do that for the first three minutes. So they're going through the gods. You can see at the very top next to the gods name, they have um, the, the icons and the symbols. These, again, are things with literature that work really well because they know what they're looking out for in their literary texts. So they'll do that. They'll work with the partner. And then um, for the next three minutes, they will complete a knowledge organizer, a blank one. We've got to the point now. So top set year seven can basically complete that on their own um, in quite a lot of detail. It, again, the fact that I come, it's an Islamic faith school. I've realized that a lot of these strategies, um, they work so well because a lot of our girls have learned the Quran from such a young age that the memory section um, of their brain is so great and so powerful. They find this incredibly, like, incredibly easy. I always joke that I don't know my telephone number and they think I'm kidding and, and I'm not, but they can just soak in this information. Um, and that is how um, we teach it really. So we do the classics lesson, but we have the knowledge organizer running through constantly. 
just with a couple of seconds left. The book um, on the left is the textbook. It's a GCC textbook, but that's what we've been using to help ourselves and to train ourselves. But just on the right hand side, it's just the benefits um, in terms of social mobility, in terms of cultural capital, which I know a few people have mentioned already. It's been you know, it, it's fantastic. Having the classics in English has just literally completely been a game changer for us. For teachers, got one teacher uh, from Mauritius and she has never, ever, ever, ever done anything to do with Greek mythology. She's absolutely loving learning it so much. Your voice matters. The girls, the students love it. Absolutely love it. Um, if we ever miss a lesson, they always jump on and they want to really... Um, ensure that we get in those lessons and uh, towards GCC, our grades nine to seven increase. And that is me done. Fab, thank you ever so much for that, Stephanie. I think for me, I've noticed that a lot of people are focusing more on classics within their key stage three curriculum, especially since those curriculum reform. That, yeah, um, totally. Uh, but what I really like with the kind of the examples that you gave is that you've got a really meaningful way to integrate it into the curriculum. So it's not just like a bolt on unit yeah. at the start of year seven to introduce you. Oh, yeah, it's totally. It's, it's embedded through, all the way through. Um, which I think I I think that's really valuable for us and thinking about how it's actually part of that conceptual development rather than just a, something that we teach at the start of yeah. year seven um, and the way that it elevates the writing and analysis too. Um, I'll pass on to Sarah now, who's going to introduce our, our sponsor slot. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, so obviously all of the events that we um, provide both online and in person could not take place without the, the support from our sponsors. Um, so we owe everything to them and we're going to hear from Brett, who is the founder uh, of People Progress in a, uh, in a moment. Can we welcome Brett into the stream? Thank you. Good morning, Brad. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, sounds like it's uh, a, a cracking event, as always. Uh, I'm super excited to be sponsoring and, and to be here. Perfect. Okay, well, you're all set up, ready to go, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, amazing. So um, I'll, I'll keep it really nice and punchy. Um, I think we've been sponsoring the Teach Me Icons now for like five years. It's just such an incredible um, event. The fact that you've got it on so many subject areas, the fact that you as teachers are here on a Saturday, giving up your time to move students forward. Um, that's why we wanted to get behind it. It's a passion of ours. I was a former teacher. So I taught for 12 years, assistant principal for nearly six of those. Um, so again, you know, credit to you guys for all being here. I'm actually just going to share screen and start talking to you about pupil progress. Just before we start though, if you are a pixel school, um, please do tune in. Tune in anyway, because I think this is going to be really useful for you. Um, but if you are a Pixel school, you'll be able to actually access the system at zero cost, all inclusive of your Pixel package. So it's a really, really um, exciting time. Uh, can you, I'm just wondering if you can actually see that screen that I'm sharing now. It should be of the system at the moment. I can just see myself. Perfect. It's always that awkward moment where we're just waiting for the technology to get going. So what you're looking at here is essentially a system that's going to actually help you do what you already know you need, which you're already probably doing. But what what our software is designed to do is to not reinvent the wheels to help you get there faster. And what you're looking at here is your own login to your own tracking system that has been built bespoke to meet the needs of you as an English teacher or head of English or anyone within your department. What you're looking at is a tracker that will calculate the grade exactly as the exam board does against the very latest grade boundaries. Again, this is no new news. We know you need to do this, but what we're doing is taking away the heavy lifting of large English departments having to try and manage you know, large amounts of question level analysis data. And what you're seeing here is it's automatically going to calculate the grade against the very um, latest grade boundaries against the target grade for the student. And we'll also tell you how many marks that student is away from their minimum target grade. So we're now providing really granular detail, not just a, a, a grade calculator. What you'll also notice as well is the ability to actually um, see how they're performing in each AO. So each one of these questions is tagged against the AO and is telling us how they're performing in those key areas. Now, of course, this is a really, you know, 
uh, dream scenario, two full mocks. We know that's not really going to be the scenario up until at least a month before the final exam. So not very useful. You can add tests to this. You can add in a topic test. So I'm going to show you just how easy that is. I want to target section B of the paper because actually I saw on that tracker that we're not performing very well in that section. I'd like this to count towards the working out grade. I'm going to add this at QLA. So I'm going to actually call this one communication and organization because I know that covers AO5 and that's 24 marks. And I'm also going to add the second question of section B, which is technical accuracy, which we know covers AO6. And that's actually 16 marks, which makes up that total. Now, I can select which trackers that appears on. And if this was a qualification across year 10, 11, I'd be able to add it to year 10 trackers too. And I'm just going to click save end of topic test. What you're seeing here is not having to worry about the lookups, multiple trackers. It's going to take me back to the tracker directly. And it's going to allow me to add marks to that test where it's going to tell me a grade and it's also going to going to show me how they're performing against those AOs that I'm trying to target now. So again, I, I can't stress this enough. We didn't actually, you know, give birth to the term QLA, but what we do know is you, you know what you want and, and software does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is help you get there far, far more um, easily and far faster. Now the individual reports, this is something that, um, has been getting a lot of attention for very good reason. It allows you to share what is happening with a student's progress. Now, we are building a parent-student portal, and you'll have the ability to print this and put it in their folders. I use this as a teacher myself for two years. It, it was actually the main reason that validated uh, me leaving teaching to get this into as many schools as we can. Currently, we're in 300, nearly 100 whole schools. Uh, our third trust comes on board in uh, a matter of weeks. So what you're seeing here is transformation of parents' evening, focus conversations, and you're also increasing students' buy-in and ownership of their qualifications. The very last thing I'm actually going to show you is the ability for you to actually look at these overarching performance of your department areas. And if you're a senior leader, if I go to the analysis area, I'm going to click here on year 11. I'm going to go to my subject analysis. The data that you need to share is created for you so that you can have those conversations without any effort whatsoever. There's no difficult filters like you have on Scissor or Four Matrix. It is presented really simply, cleanly. How are your, your class performing? How are they performing with regard to the grade distribution? And also how are they performing in their subgroups? I'm actually showing you an IGCSE example here because I know there might be some people watching internationally. And for those of you who are vice principals or actually looking at whole school attainment, every single qualification exam board and subject area is covered by pupil progress. We have something like 3,500 trackers, which means the data pulls through for every subject area. And not only that, it even calculates the key stage four grade analysis, pulling through how they're performing with regard to their A8 and their P8, which now means you've got a P8 score in real time, live. So um, if you do want to know more, simply just go to pupilprogress.com. If you want to know more about the Pixel offer, just click on the Pixel logo. If you are a Pixel school, click Get Started. And simply when you actually um, type in the name of your school, you'll be able to go to the next um, section. And it, you'll also see I'm actually going to choose a school here that I know is a Pixel school. And then when you go through, you'll see that we've uploaded all Pixel schools and you'll be able to actually start your Pixel subscription. Zero cost. It's all part of your Pixel subscription. It's part of our Pixel membership and it's something that is not going to cost you or have to get signed off by your school. Um, I'm going to stop sharing because I've gone over by 30 seconds and I know you guys run a really tight ship. So I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, you know, I hope you have an amazing session uh, for the rest of the day. I know it goes on until two and uh, looking forward to seeing you in in person and when we have a live event hopefully thanks brett yes we'll see you in person in manchester in september amazing yeah. amazing thank you so much for that please do head over to at people progress um to, to find out more thank you very much and um, before we head on to our next speaker just a reminder that you can join the selfie competition over on twitter using that hashtag um, TM in icons. We can see that quite a few people are from 
different locations around and about, including on a beach, which is definitely not where I am. It's very cold here um, up in Yorkshire. Um, our next speaker then is Zara Shah. And this um, talk, Zara is going to be building on some of those ideas that Donald mentioned earlier, the idea of threshold concepts across the Key Sage curriculum. So I'll hand straight over to Zara. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Bear with me. I am taking the risk of actually sharing my screen. So let me take all the things that I need to so that we're good to go. Fab. I have to say I was quite envious of uh, Brett's uh, quite impressive microphone there. Um, so I don't know um, where to get one of those, but I think I'm definitely adding that to my list. Okay, um, I think um, this seems to be up and running the way I need it to be. Um, if you cannot see me or if you cannot hear me, I do have the sort of Twitter um, on my side right here. So just give me uh, a little sort of reminder um, or a little a little nudge uh, if I'm basically speaking to myself in my living room. Fabulous. Okay, um, so welcome to the Whistle Stop Tour on embedding threshold concepts across the three state, key stage three curriculum. I am Zara, um, I am a serial retweeter. I am ZSS, NAS um, on Twitter. Um, so I tend to usually in the middle of the night with my nocturnal children, retweet fabulous things that other people are sharing. Um, I am not an expert on this. I'm very much at the start of my journey, which is why I am uh, inviting you to look at my Twitter handle. And if you are already on this journey, and if you have some wonderful insights to share, please do find me and please continue the conversation. Um, so uh, one of the most exciting things about the Saturday morning is I'm actually with like-minded people who have the same passion that I have for Key Stage 3. Um, and there's so many wonderful things to celebrate, and this could literally take up all of my time. Uh, but the two things that I really want to focus on as we talk about threshold concepts is that rem reminder that Key Stage 3 is sort of part of that puzzle. It's an, it's an important bridge uh, from primary school, Key Stage 2, to Key Stage 4. Um, and I recognize this, and I'm very aware of this on a regular basis as a parent. I'm aware of this on a regular basis as a primary school governor as well. So I feel quite passionate that when we're thinking about threshold concepts, we're really bearing in mind where our children are coming from, where our learners are coming from, and what we can do to sort of take them and facilitate them and support them. And challenge is also the big thing. Challenge them um, to uh, continue onwards in their wonderful learning journeys, especially while they're with us in our care. Um, so I'm trying to sort of simplify this as much as I can and um, thought about sort of the five sort of key areas that we can, uh, we can, we probably end up asked, uh, we asked ourselves when we decided um, towards last year and at the start of this year that we wanted to embed threshold concepts across our three key stage three curriculum and like quite a few of you uh, we were doing exactly the same thing where we started having those conversations and we started asking questions of our curriculum and trying to sort of see what we needed to do what tweaks we needed to add to keep um shaping it up and and into the curriculum that we felt that we would be proud to teach our children um so Threshold concepts. Now, this idea is fairly new, I would say. When I say idea, I basically mean the term threshold concepts. And it didn't come about till about 2003, uh, when uh, Eric Mayer and Ray Land, they conducted um, a study looking into effective teaching and learning environments. And essentially what they concluded was that threshold concepts were when you understood a threshold concept that resulted in a fundamental shift in your understanding of that overarching concept uh, and they actually um this is the, the this this image they used as well they 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 use this idea um they related to sort of going through a portal this kind of penny drop moment when you understand something when something's explained to you to you and you go through this gateway into this wonderful wonderful world of understanding and knowledge um which is great. Uh, so this was my starting point, really. Um, and then it goes into specific features of threshold concepts. So I'm just going to be picking out on a few of those. Um, so when you start thinking about threshold concepts, the one key thing to understand is that it needs to be something that you're teaching, which is going to help your students unlock the next stage of learning. Uh, 
Okay. Then another sort of key aspect of this is that when that stage is unlocked, when you have successfully taught a threshold concept, it should allow your students to be able to click everything together. They are threshold concepts are intended to be integrated. So when you teach one I, the threshold concept successfully, all the other bits of the learning, they start clicking, clicking together. Um, it's important to think about threshold concepts in our curriculum provision because this is what can aid the mastery of the subject and the curriculum. And the one key thing that I think I, we really, I really want to stress is the fact that um, there is um, quite a um, strong possibility they, that they are irreversible. And when I read about this, it took me back to A-level economics. Uh, and there I was revising before my the night before my exam. And I'm looking through my immaculate notes, all color coded. And on every new page, I find that I have labeled the demand curve and the supply curve incorrectly. So by the end of that, I look at my notes and I genuinely had no idea which one, the right, how the demand curve and the supply curve were supposed to be sort of organized. And that took me sort of to that moment when I thought, gosh, they are irreversible because I promise you that when I went into that exam, I was still unsure because I would consistently talk myself out of that correct answer. So I think we need to really proceed with caution when we think about threshold concepts. We need to get them right. We need to avoid what we call lethal mutations so that we, we, we avoid the risk of going down that route where we do something incorrectly and then it becomes irreversible and more challenging to take our learners back onto the track and the route that we need them to be on. Okay. So why are they important then? We are hearing about so many wonderful, fabulous, um, sort of inroads that people are making with research and ed education. And every other day we're hearing about new concepts and new ideas. Um, and when you hear that, when you're on the receiving end, you of course ask yourself that question. This is wonderful, this is interesting, but why do I need to subscribe to this new way of thinking? How does that help and support my learning? And it's a very valid question to ask. Um, and if you can't answer that question, I think sort of proceeding in a more coherent um, a manner where you buy into and you really believe in your vision, um, that you, you feel that you know that you can't really successfully do that. So you need to be able to ask answer that question uh, quite confidently. And it takes me back to one of my absolutely favorite phrases of Mary Myatt. I'm a big fan there and she knows this. Um, she talks about the curriculum as a tapestry. Um, and I love visual metaphors. And when I was thinking about the curriculum as a tapestry, I thought, right, OK, um, I've got this understanding of threshold concepts. And the way I see it, the threshold concepts are the threads that are holding that tapestry together. And occasionally you might find the same color running through. And occasionally you might find that something's really knotted together in a specific way and it keeps popping up in the patterns. And that is how I view threshold concepts to feature in to our key stage three curriculum planning. That is, it is necessary to hold the very fabric of our key stage three curriculum together. And at the same time, it needs to be carefully planned so that you can see the impact of that running all the way through. Um, it's important because um, all of us, ultimately, the destination for our students is generally the same. Let's say key stage four, uh, key stage five exams, key stage four exams. Generally, we're all headed in the same direction after key stage three. And it's important to remember that when children join us in from primary school, we start at pretty much that same sort of level. But then after that, their experience to year seven, eight and nine, they can take sort of different routes. Um, to get to that end point. And therefore, which is wonderful, which is absolutely fine, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as we ensure that they are taking the necessary pit stops along the way, so that when we talked about, I think it was Donald uh, uh, Hill who talked about um, curriculum as a progression model, and this idea that that's great, curriculum is the progression model, but how are we making sure that students are genuinely progressing? And he talks about assessing skills along the way, but I'm saying taking those necessary pit stops um, are really important to make sure that our students have the requisite skills that they need so to successfully take on the challenges of the next stage. So we need to think about uh, threshold concepts to ensure that there's parity. And when we assign, we, we talk about, we chunk our curriculum down into those concepts, we're basically supporting our students to manage that cognitive load and that's integral to help them create uh, those mental models of those ideas, like when Donald talks about metaphors um, in their long-term memory. So once we kind of understand that bit, the next stage is to start thinking, and this is the hard bit, 
What do you prioritize? Which concepts? Um, and a lot of critics do say that this is the problematic bit as well when you start deciding, well, this is a threshold concept, this isn't. So I tried to simplify this process because we were in the same sort of conundrum. Um, and I mean, I don't, it doesn't help, but I do say it really does depend. It depends on what you want to achieve. And it depends on what the main sort of knowledge gaps are when you're looking at your children, especially in key stage four. And you look back and you think, you know, what could it, they, they have done differently in key stage three for them to be uh, more successful learners in key stage four? And, the main, and then you work backwards from that. And I think that one of the big questions that you have to keep asking yourself is, you know, when you're in that classroom in that moment and you inherit a new class and you're thinking, right, you know, I'm about to teach this new idea, this new um, topic, this new poem. And that moment when you're thinking, oh, I really wish they'd know about this. I wish they'd known about that so that now I could build upon this in this manner. So when you start thinking, oh, I wish they knew this before they came into my room, that Sometimes, you know, thinking about it, that could be that threshold concept that you really want to make sure that you embed in your curriculum. So what I did was uh, we worked backwards. We looked at, for instance, um, the AQA spec um, and we were looking, we were really sort of thinking about structure and how structure was something that was not featuring into our key stage three provision in a more, in as systematic a manner as we wanted it to. So we decided that that was one key area that we wanted to focus on. The next key area we sort of thought uh, thought about came from this beautiful, exquisite piece of writing that one of my year sevens did. Um, you can't really see this. I don't know if you can zoom in on it when I share the slides, but the um, expert manner in which he weaves in and out of really complex sentence structures was so impressive. I annotated this under a visualizer with my class. And at one point she uses this technique called anadiplosis. And I turned around to her and I said, do you, do you recognize what you've just done there? But she didn't have a word for that idea. She didn't have a word for that concept. And she said, no. So obviously this was a child who had a real passion and love for reading and writing. But I thought to myself, if my year seven child can do this, what can I do to support my GCSC students to be able to write in that creative manner with that fluidity? When I give them a feedback to vary the sentence openers and they're limited by fronted adverbials that they were taught in primary schools, what can we do differently to make sure that those students have those requisite skills, those concepts, so that they can just run wild uh, with the, the skills that are there at their disposal? So there, um, the next sort of question, once we decided that structure and writing is what we were focusing on, the next question that we wanted to ask our curriculum uh, was where do we incorporate these concepts? And for this, um, I loved your coding. So I basically converted our, our sort of key stage three plans into images and I, uh, I projected this onto my screen and I sat in the back of my classroom and I just started connecting the dots. And I basically looked for moments where I could ensure that all students were going through the same route at that moment in time so that all of them uh, could explicitly be taught the threshold concepts that we had decided were valuable to their learning and necessary. So for example, for year eight, we identified narrative writing. And Freya talks about it as well, bringing in to, if we talk about structure in key stage four, let's take it all the way back. And let's make sure we're building in with the starting point, which is of course, Frey Tax Pyramid. So term one, we're doing narrative writing. We're doing it thinking about Frey Tax Pyramid. Term two, you take it up a notch and you let students think about that non-linear narrative, try to be a bit cyclical, manipulating structure comes in because they need to learn the structure to be able to successfully dismantle the structure. Term three, take it further and start thinking about conscious crafting and the seven basic plot lines. And you don't stop there. You don't stop at year eight and you don't think, right, I need to now look at the next writing unit. You, the cross sort of um, references are really important when you're thinking about threshold concepts. So when I looked at the year nine curriculum, I thought, right, this is excellent because let's look at Macbeth um, in the Shakespeare section. And over there, this would be a wonderful opportunity for students to now analyze the structure when they're thinking about that traditional tragedy. And when they're thinking about that moment of climax, the banquet scene and that moment of anonarisis. So this is a wonderful opportunity to let students continue to build those cognitive mental models. And you don't stop there. You take it outside of the classroom. So then we turned into um, we turned them into displays. Uh, this is a wonderful um, um, graphic uh, story called The Last Woman, um, which is excellent, by the way, if you're teaching structure. And then uh, we converted it into a display in our corridor. 
Uh, and this is an interactive display, which makes me think about Freya's uh, working uh, wall as well. So it was about making sure that everyone was using that shared common language. Moving on to writing. I'm going to whiz through this because I'm conscious of time. Moving on to writing. So again, moving away from fronted adverbials, we get them in year seven, talk about adverbials of time, place, build in um, that fluidity, um, that conscious crafting. You can't teach post-modification till you've made them understand what noun phrases are. So allowing students to extend those noun phrases and then taking that up a notch and teaching them how to extend metaphors successfully. You cement that in year seven so that when you get those same students in year eight, you can talk about extended metaphors with ease and with confidence because you know that this is something they've covered. When you're looking at noun phrases, you don't stop there. When we do um, academic writing in year nine and we're talking about writing introductions to essays, Think about a positives, um, expanding those noun phrases, a positives when you're introducing your characters, Lady Macbeth, the fiend like queen. So it's all about finding those different opportunities where you can space um, interweaving so that you can help students build those cognitive mental models, which are designed to be retrieved over time. It's about reminding yourself that it's not just also about opportunity, but also about challenge. And I love how Mary Mike talks about desirable difficulties. So I promise I'm about to nearly end this. Now this bit, how do we embed the teaching of these concepts? This could literally just be an entire, uh, quite a long session. And I am talking about this at a teaching learn, at the Teaching Learning Leeds Conference in Leeds in June. If you are in the North, do find us there. It's at the Grammar School at Leeds. So I will be talking about it at length. But if I summarize this slide in a nutshell, I would say that the vision that you have and to be able to justify to your team why you do this is important. Once you've done that, it's about reminding yourself that you cannot teach these concepts in isolation. You need to build synergy across your curriculum. You need to ensure that you have spacing and you have interleaving. Once you've made that decision, you standardize the resources because you cannot afford to get these threshold concepts wrong. You start using that shared common language. You give students and teachers maybe a glossary where they can record and cement and store this information that is going to allow them to retrieve it um, from their working memory into their long term memory to allow that transfer. Um, it's about then building it into the architecture of your Q&A. So we have learning walks where we go in to see how other st uh, members of staff are trying trialing these threshold concepts and embedding them into um, their provision um, and uh, into their classrooms. It's about um, then converting it into an agenda item on a department meeting um, and asking members of staff to share their best practice um, on how they are trialing this and how they're using it and how students are responding to it. So this is very much a work in progress um, and this is where we are at. So we're, we're at the start of this journey. Thank you very much for joining me and thank you for your time. If you do have any questions or if there's something I wish through, uh, please do find me on Twitter and please do hold me to account. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Zara. I think for me, like likening it to the tapestry and using that Mary Mayer quote was really, really useful. I haven't really thought as much about how threshold concepts can turn into those lethal mutations before. So a, a question that I'm going away with is really thinking about how am I stopping those like knots and wrong bits of the tapestry and um, cropping up so that they don't have to be unpicked later on. So yeah, thank you so much. I'll pass on to Sarah, um, who will introduce the next bit. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're actually going to take a short break now. So we're breaking for 10 minutes and we'll return at 11.45. So please do um, grab a cuppa or something stronger, who knows, uh, this Saturday. And we'll be returning at 11.45. We'll see you then.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've had a nice break. So we're returning for the second part of this session. Um, we'll be hearing from all of our fabulous speakers in a moment. Um, but first, we'll be hearing from the second of our sponsors today, which is Teachers Love Stationery Club. So we'll just welcome uh, we'll just welcome Sabrina into the stream now. Hi, hi, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Sabrina and I'm the co-founder and co-owner at Teachers Love Stationery Club. Um, we started our sub subscription box because um, I'm really into stationery, um, but there wasn't really anything out there that provided stationery for sort of used by teachers it was more like mm, felt like more office environment stuff and actually I wanted something that was specifically tailored to teachers and uh, well there wasn't anything there so I just started doing it myself and um, I've got one of our boxes to show you today and also um, some of our latest uh, new arrivals to our shop which is our own teacher planner uh, which we have produced um, in collaboration with um, a focus group that we have so hopefully it'll suit the needs of most teachers um, so firstly, I'm going to show you our February box. I really wanted to show you the March box, but um, some people will only just be receiving them. And just in case we do have any subscribers uh, in the um, TMI event today, I didn't want to spoil the surprise for them, but it really is a very beautiful box. So instead of doing March's box, I'm going to show you February's box. So um, our boxes are £12.50. Uh, that includes postage and they're approximately A4 size and about two centimetres thick. So they come straight in through your door and you won't have to worry about getting a sorry we missed you card from the post office. And uh, when you open it, so that's a piece of paper that I've already partially unwrapped this one. Now, if you use our code today, uh, which is English 10, you'll get two pounds off your first box and your personalised pencil case, instead of normally, there's like a little star here, but um, instead of the start, you'll be getting our English special with a little silhouette of Shakespeare on there. So you uh, can get this um, limited, this uh, particular pencil case with the code. And the theme for February's box, every month we have a different theme, and it was Lunar New Year. And this year is the Year of the Tiger. So I have this lovely little desk pad here with uh, the Year of the Tiger, and plenty of space to write on there. Quite pretty colours. We also... Uh, included a new item which is some little um, reward certificates so um, we're focusing on courage and resilience this month and encouraging resilience in our learners so there was four of those and to go with those we had two sheets of reward stickers for amazing resilience the courage champion as well you also get a little insert in your box detailing what's in there and a little note from us and lastly, in uh, the February box, we had two beautiful pens uh, with uh, lovely Chinese designs on them. Uh, let me see if I can turn that around. And a tiger pen. A set of tiger vinyl stickers, which at um, my school, my um, students love to stick them on the front of their exercise books. I use these as reward stickers as well. And some little sticky tab page markers so you can write little notes on there or mark pages in your books. So uh, the other thing I wanted to really quickly show you today is um, our teacher planners. They come in day per page, which, oh, actually this one is day per page. And uh, here we go, that's what the day per page section looks like. There's um, plenty of space for extra bits of paper here. And uh, oh, I'm gonna take you to the front. Calendars, monthly overviews and so forth. But we, as I say, we worked with the teacher focus group and removed everything that people say they don't really use. So we've just put in what people really need and at the back assessment pages as well, which was um, which was highlighted as something that people still use. So that's the day per page and that is £22.50. It includes free personalisation. You've got this um, protective plastic cover to keep it looking really smart all year round. And you can choose your own font and colour from the selection that is available when you order. Or alternatively, we have the week per double spread, which gives you the week overview. All the rest of the pages are identical. It's just those two that are different. So you can choose from six different covers, designs, and uh, you can choose for every cover design. It's available in week per spread or day per page. And also we're going to have um, matching um, uh, like accessory packs available as well. So there'll be a notebook, a to-do list pad, some decorative stickers and some washi tape, all in the same design as the cover 
on your um, planner and they are £10 extra. So the most you will pay for our planner, including personalization and the accessory pack is uh, £32.50. And you know, prices start from £20 for the week per double spread. Um, so please do check those out. As I said, there's six designs. I've got the um, cool geometric design here and the Midnight Galaxy design here for you to see. But yeah, check out all of the designs because there's some lovely ones on there and they've been quite popular. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you do want to buy anything or subscribe on our website, please use the code ENGLISH10. You'll get £2 off your first box and the specific English pencil case. Or if you use the code ENGLISH10 in our shop, you'll get 10% off anything in there, including our planners and accessory kits. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Yes, please do head over to TLS underscore dot underscore club at the Hewlett Stationery. Um, thank you very much, Sabrina. Thank you. Cheers then. I just want to um, alert people to a change to the schedule today, actually. Um, a couple of people are feeding into the live stream asking about Kate McCabe's session. Um, unfortunately, Kate couldn't be with us live today, so she has sent us a recording of her talk, and we will be showing that um, soon, very soon. Um, but we're going to hear from our keynote, so I'll pass over to Richard, who's going to introduce Lindsay. <laughs> So um, our second keynote is Lindsay Skinner, who's a head teacher, but also has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to English. And I personally have found her book um, on crafting sentences absolutely invaluable as a head of department. And in terms of not just the, the knowledge and the CPD for the department, but also the resources and the, the impact that it's had on workload whilst um, really contributing to the um, impact of our curriculum as well. Um, so I'll hand right over to Lindsay, who's going to be talking about maximising progress in writing at Key Stage 3. Thank you very much. Okie dokie. So um, uh, my name's Lindsay, as Rich said, and um, at the moment I'm a head teacher. I'm hoping to stay that way. And um, so I, sometimes I feel a little bit uh, fraudulent coming back to, to speak about English, but I do manage the um, uh, curriculum across our whole trust at the moment for English. So I'm in charge of making sure that all of the schemes of learning are what we want them to be in the long-term plans and all that. But actually that's, they're written by our teachers across our trust, across our schools. But at the moment that's, that's an area across our trust that I lead on. So I've got uh, quite a passion and interest in curriculum, obviously. Um, and then moving, moving forward, um, what I would like to do is is really look at key stage three because I think key stage three is a little bit of a problem um, and, and I don't think I'm alone in that. So when we look at uh, key stage three, I think um, you will all be aware. I, I, don't, I find it difficult to talk about lack of progress at key stage three because I think that progress is notoriously difficult to measure. But I do think there's a, an obvious stickiness that is there and everyone that's ever taught key stage three classes will be familiar with this kind of list that I've put together of the classic kind of stickiness issues that you get when you teach key stage three. So there's obviously the, oh, I don't know how to start or the lack of ideas and not knowing how to piece together a, a, a piece of text or plan effectively. That's really, really common. And then obviously you also get this lack of stamina. Um, and I would say that that's even true through to GCSE. Then, then we kind of move into the more technical stuff so that you get probably lots of children who don't necessarily uh, structure or paragraph their writing well. They're not using effective vocabulary. Like they might be using really long words like discombobulate, but they're not necessarily using them effectively. And then there's all of the accuracy stuff. I think that that is really, really common at Key Stage 3. But what's difficult about that is that that is not uh, true at Key Stage 2. And anyone who has gone down and he works in an all through school, which I did for the five years before I was so so before um, I was head, I for a year worked as um, director of education across the trust, and I largely worked in primary. And then uh, the five years before that, I was working um, in an all through school, so I was lucky enough to get to do some work at Key Stage Two, and. Um, what I found fascinating all of the time is how beautifully the children wrote at Key Stage 2 and then how quickly that fell apart once they got to Key Stage 3. So uh, I started to think about why that was and unpick that. And um, I think there are a few solutions that we can we can uh, put in place to avoid this kind of stickiness that we've got at Key Stage 3. So um, 
I was hoping this would fade in one by one, but it isn't. And I don't really know why, because I'm not very good at IT. But um, I'm just going to talk you through what the expected standard is. And I've put a link in there as well um, so that you can have a look at this yourself. But, you, you know, you're getting a significant proportion of your children, regardless of your context, will be at the expected standard when they come up to secondary school. And what's interesting about that is that means that consistently across a range of texts that they have written, they are able to show that they can adapt their writing for, for audiences and that they can describe settings and character and atmosphere effectively, that they can accurately integrate dialogue into their text and that that's often used deliberately to move on action. Um, they're able to select their vocabulary, grammatical structures effectively. And um, and what I've done is I've highlighted each one of those things, like that they're, they're able to use devices uh, that deliberately make a text cohesive, use verb tenses uh, consistently. And yet I've got so many key stage three children who don't do that. Um, they're using a range of vocabulary. They're using a range of punctuation. They're using that for effect and they're spelling correctly. So if that's the case, if so many children at key stage two are able to do all of those things, why is it that when we get them, that, that they're not, right? Um, and so I think as a young teacher, I thought it was because they were lying at Key Stage 2. And well, I just was like, well, they obviously aren't. And they just said that they're at the expected standard or at level four and five back in the day. Um, and, and they're actually not. But then I worked in an all through school and then I worked in primary and I realized that they are. They are writing in that way. So why aren't they doing it when they get to us? Because when you look at that descriptor, right, and then you map it against the GCSE descriptors, it's actually a bit frightening. So I've just mapped it in here. The legibility with handwriting is, is kind of irrelevant, um, other than that they need to be able to write legibly. But if you look at AO5, this is taken um, from the AQA spec, just it's the most common, commonly used. Um, I've mapped in what the AO5 descriptors are there, the communicating clearly and effectively bit, and then the organizing information and ideas. And it, that is mirrored in what the expected standard is at key stage two. And then when you look at AO6, it's exactly the same. Um, like when you look at expected standard for writing, when they're meeting that effectively and the children that, that are, are meeting that, then that's like a GCSE grade four or five. And yet these kids often who, who get the expected standard do not come out at a grade five at GCSE. So something is falling away there. It isn't, and this has been problematic for, for, for a long, long, long time. So um, just so that you can really see what an expected standard looks like, I'm just going to give you uh, a little second to just, these are taken directly from the moderated. Uh, so it's like you get a moderation process. Um, it's blind moderation. So, so like you might be, be in a primary school and then um, every three years you're going to get somebody ringing and saying, right, we're moderating. But this happens in an ad hoc way. And therefore they've decided what they think that their children have got. And they create folders of assessment that show what they think their children have got. And then they get a phone call that says, you're going to be moderated this year. And so it is a really robust system. But um, in order to standardize before that process, they get given exemplary materials, much like we do at GCSE. And so this is an example of an expected standard. So I'll just give you a, an opportunity to just read that. What I think is fascinating about that is that that's written by an 11 year old. And yet I think in terms of tone, they have grasped fully the for like the right formality of of the um, text. It feels almost like it's written by a person of, of that time. Not not quite. But I mean, they're only 11. Right. And there's a mastery there of, of punctuation and uh, a range of punctuation. Not not like necessarily high level, but um, you know, exclamation mark, commas, used pretty much effectively throughout. Sentence demarcation, which seems to fall away totally by the time they get to year nine, where it's just like you get a paragraph, to like comma, 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 and at the end of the paragraph, they put a full stop. That is all mastered here. Uh, I'll give you another example. This one is nonfiction. So I wanted to put uh, like a, 
um, an argument type one like we would get a GCSE. So again, I'll just give you a second to read that. Okay, so that is just the expected standard. You know, like over 80% of kids are expected to be writing at this standard. And you're looking at vocabulary, not always spelled correctly, Lee, but like symbolizes, declined, neighborhood, um, allocated, consequently, vandalism, offensive, contrary. Um, like it is quite impressive. And that's not even before we get to greater depth, right? So you get to greater depth. And I read that. I read range of purposes and audiences, appropriate register, assured and conscious control, semicolons, dashes, colons, hyphens, and precise punctuation that enhances meaning. And all I think of is level four of the stupid exam that I spent too many days of my life marking. Because it that literally... It, it describes basically uh, top of level three into level four. That's that's what it's describing. And I read some of the greater depth work that comes out of our trust. And there's this kind of weirdly humbling moment of like, oh, hang on, the kids in year six are writing as well as uh, some of our middle set year tens. This is problematic. Why is this? Right. So this is clearly a problem. I think that reading this stuff, you'll see, I'm just going to show you in a great depth, a depth a, a, a example. Now, I think you will agree if you didn't agree already, although if you're watching this, maybe you did, um, that there is a problem. And I think it's a transition problem. And that's why I'm going to talk about that. So I'll just give you a second to read this great depth text. There are longer texts. I've just taken the start of each one. So in this one, I, there's clearly some deliberate crafting. There's little moments like silky tutus, a bit underwhelming, but th there's some really nice deliberate crafting. This, um, Although I would argue there needs to be a comma after then suddenly. But then suddenly the stage director is at the door calling my name, full stop. My name, full stop. My stomach gives an unexpected flutter and I take a deep breath. As the stage door swings open, I tell myself everything will be okay. Nothing can possibly go wrong in the in the, the dashes. I think that that's that's done really well. It's a deliberately crafted piece, and and I think a lot of us would be pleased if our children were starting to write that way. And it, and it's interesting because although um, um, although you've got this situation where you've got like um, it's not like amazing vocabulary, but it's really apt vocabulary, this, the unexpected flutter. Everyone knows exactly what that feels like in their belly, right? I just I just had it before I came on here because I was like, oh, I don't know if my slides are going to work. That Everyone knows what that feels like. So it is really apt. Um, and this is, this is written really beautifully. So what is the difference? Ofsted, oh, sorry. So I forgot that I had this slide in. Right. Um, they, they're all writing this, the people who are getting greater depth, all the ones you saw before, and they are writing like that consistently, apart from those really who are struggling and who obviously would be working towards identify before they came in. And yet we're getting this, right? So what is the difference? Well, Ofsted released, it, released um, a thing, as you will be aware, um, they talked about the wasted years in Key State Street, and this was in 2015. And I would argue that that report has done very little to improve things. So Firstly, I think it's worth saying that, um, highlighting what they thought was wrong and I, then I, what I think they missed out on. So they they said that um, uh, Key Stage 3 is not a priority of leaders. 
um, and that as timetablers, it's not a, a priority, and that 85% of people timetabled key stage uh, four and five before key stage three. Now, I, I think that's about two things. So firstly, is you get what you measure for, right? So if key stage four and key stage five are the things that um, – they're the things that you get measured for, then obviously school leaders are going to put importance on that. But also I think this shows a fundamental misunderstanding of timetabling because you have to timetable key stage four first because of the way that timetables are blocked. It would be almost impossible, and I speaking as a timetabler, it would be almost impossible to timetable key stage three first because it's got what, what we call like the salt and pepper pots, which is where like they're, um, they might have art, they could be in art or they could be in IT or they could be in tech or they could be, you know, somewhere else in the curriculum they're all ticked together and they're the things that you timetable last because they're the most flexible if you timetable the most flexible bits first then you wouldn't be able to timetable English and maths and actually that would lead to loads of split classes so there is a fundamental I think misunderstanding there but staffing can be staffing can be decided first that's different from timetabling um so just I, I think that that's just worth pointing out. Um, they talk about the fact that a lot of transition is pastoral. I agree. I think that that's fair enough. I'm not sure that makes the difference. And they also talk about schools not necessarily building on prior learning, which I think is a fair point. Like for a long time in my early career, we were teaching blooming haikus uh, in year seven and um, and not really doing any like proper level of, of stretch building on what they could already do. They do acknowledge that we do a lot to build on literacy skills, which was good. Um, and they talk about homework not being consistent. But the things that they pick out, I don't think are the fundamental difference makers. So they talk about homework, they talk about timetabling and staff, and they talk about not building on prior learning. I think the issue is our pedagogical approach, because I think there is a, a lack of knowledge and understanding of the pedagogical approach that is taken by most primary schools. And therefore, we don't do it. And then they come up into key stage three and we teach them in a really different way. And all of the structure is essentially stripped out from them. And then they get cognitive overload and they cannot cope. And so I just wanted to outline kind of what is common in primary and how we can then mirror that into our key stage three to prevent that from happening. So this is a really common pedagogy at key stage two. So it's um, Pi Corbett's talk for writing. Not every primary school uses it, but it is really, really common, right? So um, what I would recommend you do, firstly, is for your core feeders, figure out what they do. But it will be some version, I imagine, of this. This is incredibly common across Key Stage 2. So Freya talked about the cold task, but basically, I'm, I mean, I'm not really sure about the efficacy of a cold task because I always think, well, yeah, I mean, I haven't taught them. It's not a surprise they can't do it well. Um, so you get this kind of like false notion of progress. But um, the aim of a cold task in talk for writing is the idea that they can produce something independently, uh, regardless of that teaching. I would argue what we get when we get to key stage three and the fact that they then can't write independently shows that the cold task doesn't really do what it's aimed to do. But there we go. Then um, they, they move into what they call the um, imitation phase. So... Let me just talk you through how it works. The first thing to say is that the imitation phase, the in innovation phase and the uh, invention phase, and then even moving into the final assessment, that would usually take one week per piece. So each phase is going to be about-ish a week. Now, it might be a bit longer if it's um, a fiction. It might be a bit shorter if it's a non-fiction, but it's about a week per one. Now, if you think about that, how slow that is, to be creating one or two pieces of writing. That is really, really different from what we're doing at Key Stage 3. So uh, let me just talk you through each of the phases now they work. I've briefly mentioned the cold task, which is basically here's, you know, here's what we're going to write about, write it. Um, so the imitation phase is that they introduce a text, and usually the text is about a side of A4, um, and it's it'll be some kind of story or description or whatever. So you might have like a beautiful gothic or suspenseful journey through a graveyard or whatever it might be. So they introduce that as a text, as a beautiful model. And then what they do is they explore that text to ensure that every kid absolutely nails their understanding of it. So that means that they group read it, they chant it, they recite it, they learn little passages, they do little oracy activities, they do drama activities like hot seating and all of that old kind of old school stuff, really. Um, 
Then they look at some of the tough vocabulary and pick it out and explore what it means. Um, they do basic comprehension of it to ensure that they understand what is happening and when and why. And they story map it. So they spend a whole week just ensuring that there's a full understanding of this text. And then in this imitation phase, what they do is they then zoom in and go, OK, look at these bits of effective vocabulary. And they pick them out and go, I want you, we're just going to look at just this sentence. Let's highlight the vocabulary we really love. And now you're going to mirror, and they quite often do this on mini whiteboards, although sometimes it's done in the books too, little flash bits of writing where they've got a sentence here and then the kids trying to create the same effect but with different vocabulary, rewrite the sentence so that their cognitive lobe is really well managed, right? Because they're not worrying about punctuation, not worrying about sentence structure, they're only focusing on vocabulary. So then they do that again. And they repeat, and literally it's called the imitation phase because they imitate it. They imitate each version of a sentence, and that might be to vary the vocabulary. Then they might look at, and you see that kid did it in the uh, Greater Depth one where she said, um, and then the director's running through the door calling my name, full stop, my name. They would look at that as a structure and go, right, how could you create the same kind of thing um, uh, but change the word. So you're still going to have this repetition at the end and the repetition is still going to be something, 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 comma, something, 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 full stop, and then the repetition. So it might be like, um, uh, and everyone's going to be watching me on the stage and listening to my voice, full stop, my voice. So they learn a structure like that and they are taught to imitate it. Right. That And uh, so they do that with sentence structures. They might do that with um, uh, discourse markers and things to help with uh, fluency through the text. And they certainly do it with vocabulary. And they just imitate and they imitate it so that they're trying to create a similar effect. Then when they get to the innovation phase, they do something a bit different. So the first thing that they often do is they start boxing the text. So they say, like, OK, this is the first thing that happens in the text. Second thing, third thing, fourth thing, et cetera. And that's in a little like boxed off already made by the teacher. And then what the kids have to do is think, well, if I was going to write my own version of this story, what would it look like? What would the innovation be? So it might be like an inverted version or instead of it being an alien coming to ruin the world, it might be a robot or whatever it might be. You know, instead of it being a vampire in your gothic scene, it might be a zombie, whatever. Um, and they they edit in where they would, they're sim, it's going to be a really similar storyline. It's going to map exactly what the storyline was before, but then they put in their own characters and their own settings and slightly innovated version of it. And then what they do is they go back to, well, what was that, what was that sentence structure we really loved in this part of the text? So in the part of the text, that second paragraph, we were building up suspense about the fact this kid was going to go and perform. We used a sentence structure where we had this sentence structure and full stop and then a repeated little um, standalone fragment. And then they're like, right, oh, yeah. So in the context of my story, let's practice again some of those. And so in their planning, they've already got those in there. And they've rewritten them. So, you know, if it might not be a performance, it might be something else like, um, uh, um, you know, um, I heard from the hospital and they said it was my mum full stop, my mum. So it's exactly the same structure. This is like the third time they're doing it now. And the second time they're doing it, so they've seen it, I guess that's the first time. Then they've practiced it, mimicking it. Now they're taking it for their own use, the same kind of effect, but used in a different context. And then finally, so that means they've kind of planned their whole things. But you think about that level of planning that they've done with completely structured, supported innovation, plus using exactly the same methods that the writers used, but just innovated for their own piece of, piece of writing. And then, um, then they've taken that and then they're going to write. And that is really different from what we do, which is oh, well, what, what I think we commonly do at Key Stage 3, and not everyone will be doing this, but is where we give them an opportunity and they quite often like might do a bit of planning either with mind mapping or some bullet points or those kind of things. It's really, really different. Like it's so so structured and so scaffolded so um then they go um into their uh writing piece and then they do a slow writing and then that's often then they get feedback either from the teacher or from their peers or themselves and they look back at well these are the methods that the writer used and this is how they use them now look back at your writing have you used them in that same way yes or no could you change it and then they edit and then they they write again 
that's their hot task. And then quite often they do another one when they're introduced to a similar text with really similar, and quite often these are why they're written by the teacher, really similar use of those methods, exactly the same methods, so that you're not, again, not weighing on the cognitive load. And then they rewrite another, they replan and box up another one and then they write it. So that's really common practice at pedagogy, uh, at teachers too, which is essentially like this. This is a beautiful bit of painting done by somebody who I don't know on Twitter, but um, it's just paint by numbers. This person's like, I can't paint. It's like, well, you can paint if it's paint by numbers. And I think that that's what they're doing at key stage two, uh, but we're not doing it at key stage three. What is common practice at key stage three is that we use really high quality examples like, here's Dickens. And now I'm going to do a bit like Dickens and then we're going to do it as a group. And now off you go. And they're like, what do you mean? This is only three lessons in. And in primary school, this would be like 10 lessons in, 10 lessons of getting used to it. And then we do quite a lot of, as I said before, bullet pointed planning. Uh, we, we do quite often some like, I would like to see you using similes or metaphors, or I'd like to see you using varied sentence structures or this type of vocabulary. But what we don't do is that specificity of, I only want you to use for the fancy ones, I only want you to use these three structures or these three bits of vocabulary or these three bits of whatever. And specifically, here is how it's written and practiced. And this is where it's going to sit in your text. And this is the reason why we don't do that as well, I don't think. And when I say we, like, I'm aware that there'll be loads of you who are doing this well. I guess really I'm meaning me. but um, uh, And we do quite often writing over a, a lesson or two very quickly and then some peer assessment. Um, so what do I think we can do to change things? Well, I think that we can we can bridge the gap really, really easily. So I think we need to be really careful about our selected examples. So when, you know, we've just been talking about threshold concepts. I think that the first thing you need to do is decide, like, what are your what are your threshold concepts um, that are really necessary? So for me, like the main clause, it won't surprise you given what I think about sentence structures, that uh, the main clause for me is the most important threshold concept that we have in our whole subject, in my opinion. But then I think that the idea that um, there are additional ingredients for sentences that can be used that will open up ways of writing like that, like that great adept kid uh, did. So I would just, I think that they're really important. So I would, I would identify the component parts of either sentences or vocabulary that we think are either threshold or, or important. So like um, when we teach nonfiction writing, we do the journalistic aside that because if you read any like kind of nice uh, opinion pieces in the Guardian or the Indo or whatever, they could often use slightly sardonic journalistic asides. And they're often um, actually in a double dash rather than in brackets, but we teach it uh, brackets and double dash and, and commas. And we talk about how you get that sardonic tone. And we explicitly teach that and about what the effect of it is and about how persuasive it can be because it makes you like a born all that. We teach that from year seven. And then we repeat it again in year eight. And then when we get to year 11 and they're, they're getting ready to do their, their article writing for um, key stage four exams, we revisit it again. But they've already practiced it enough by then. They get it. Um, so so that's what I mean. Pick out the things that you want. So you want we want them to be able to do journalistic exercise, but other people, it might be that they want them to be able to do other things. Fine. Um, pick those and then make sure they're in your carefully selected examples of writing. And then basically explore the text, reading it, um, checking the vocabulary and then doing. I'm reticent about doing the drama version, but only because whenever I did drama, it was like running and fighting. And that was basically it. But um, some, definitely some story mapping is important and those comprehension questions are important. Then look at those methods. And I think it's nice and useful to call them methods early on. The, and the methods you need to look at really are vocabulary, center structures, text structures, literary devices. Then do the boxing and then a slow write. So how might that actually look in terms of a slowed down key stage three curriculum when they first get into? So this is talking about transition, not talking about doing this all the way through year um, eight and into year nine, because that would be bonkers. We wouldn't have enough time to do what we need to do. So. I think it could look like this when they first arrive at year seven, particularly if you if you do writing straight away. So in week one, it's that um, initial phase where you're just introducing the story. And so each one of these is, is a lesson, right? So you've got week one, introducing the story and reading it and that sort of stuff. Story mapping, maybe some kind of readings and drama type stuff, and then comprehension. 
in week two, it's about those specific methods. So you pick out them, right, so you go back to the same story, you look and get the kids to pick out and you pick out as well, the vocabulary that is beautiful, and then you teach them to mimic it using the, the framework of the sentence as a scaffold. You do the same with the sentence structures, the same with the text structure and the devices used to make the text fluid, and the same with the literary devices, and then literally just mimicking. Then in week three, you're actually like, okay, well, imagine, that's my timer saying, I'm getting towards the end. Um, imagine that you uh, are going to innovate this. And then you, you talk to them about all the different ideas and share all those ideas, do the boxing up, plan their methods in and practice their methods for a whole two lessons and putting those into the plan just uh, based on the stuff that you studied from week two. And then it's not until week four that you're writing. And then obviously you would move on do some editing based on the success criteria that you've got. And so then your success criteria and your assessment is going to look a bit different, right? Because it's not going to be, I want you to use a range of punctuation and I want you to use a range of sentence structures and I want you to do this that, and the other. It's not going to be that. It's going to be, I want you to use this specific sentence structure, this specific type of vocabulary for this effect. And, and it's, have you done these specific things that we have taught you? So our children expect when they are assessed in year seven for the journalistics that writing, they expect that they will be assessed on um, uh, referring to an expert and a, and a way there's like, we've got a structure of referring to an expert and how you do that. And then they've also, they would expect to be assessed on their journalistic aside. And they would know that you don't write a piece of journalistic writing without that reference to an expert, without a journalistic aside and without anecdote. You don't do that because that's what we do when we write journalistic pieces in the Ted Rag Trust. And so um, our assessment is different, much different from how when I was at a department, so I was just more like, use all these devices or use any devices, whereas now we're much more specific about what we want. And then we repeat that, which is useful for their long-term memory. So if this was like the first six weeks, your first term really, then I think you get to that point where um, you would have, uh, you could squash it up. And I think the aim would be to get it in the long run by the time you get to year eight, really, that this whole process of introducing a story and making sure that you understand it, picking out what works really well in that story, mimicking it and then innovating it, boxing it and planning it and moving into writing could take about a week and a half by the time you'd got into year eight. So this is like the squashed up version of like a latter part of year seven, because then what you could do is you could have, you know, a scheme of learning that was actually uh, on a novel or, or poetry or whatever it might be, and then drop in a week and a half of some of this writing structure. But what this does for me is it just it doesn't take away all of the beautiful scaffolding that is in place at Key Stage 2 because I think it might be really easy to be like, oh, this is just way too structured. We're just giving them way too much. And in a way, I agree. But when you look back at those examples that you have that you saw at the start and everyone was like, oh, blimey, they're good. It clearly works, right? It clearly works. So if it works, let's do it and then work to slowly squish squish down the amount of time we're spending on it, which in and of itself, so we're doing the same process but spending less time on it, in and of itself is removing the scaffolding. And then over a period of time, because they will be so practiced at this, it's it just becomes how they approach a text. So they approach, they approach writing by thinking, oh, hang on, I'm doing a journalistic piece, and I, I'm going to write a journalistic piece. They haven't even got a stimulus test anymore, but they know in a journalistic piece, I do need to have some kind of anecdote. I do need to have reference to some kind of higher uh, knowledge. And I do need a journalistic aside. And it's often in this part of the, the piece of writing, it will be there. So I think, I think that that is probably uh, what I would recommend you do to ease the transition from year seven, sorry, year six into year seven, because I think it's a tough one. I think so many children feel that they're good at English at key stage two and then don't feel that anymore at key stage three and so that is where what i'd recommend you do thanks so much lindsay that was brilliant um and we know how incredibly busy you are so we can't thank you enough for giving up your time to speak uh, for us this morning thank you so much um and it was certainly a powerful reminder of all of the brilliant work that's done at key stage two um, and the responsibility and the challenge that we have to build on that when the students join us in year seven so yeah it certainly has huge implications for how we can enhance their writing knowledge when they when they join us thank you so much and um, if you're if you're watching live from home and you have any further questions please do um 
tweets Lindsay directly um, on Twitter and also using the hashtag TMingIcons too. Um, but thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you for asking. Okay, um, so just a reminder about the selfie competition that we're running um, across the day. We have some fabulous prizes to give away, which have been kindly donated by um, members of the, the English community. So we have several um, edu books that have been donated. And we also have some visualizers to raffle out as well at the end of this session. And we also have some free um, passes to online CPD. So if you want to be in with a shot of winning one of those, all you need to do is take a, a selfie of yourself watching um, this event online and tweet it using the hashtag TMingIcons. Um, and Amy's going to be monitoring the social media and, and, and picking out some, some winners, which we'll share at the end of the, the event. Okay, so next up, we have Mary um, behind Portly, who is going to be, I guess, building on from Lindsay's ideas about writing at, at Key Stage 3. And she's going to be talking to us about how, uh, well, she's going to be sharing her thoughts on planning a coherent and cohesive writing curriculum. So I can see that you're all ready to go, Mary. So, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, there's a lot been said about writing so far today. And part of what I'm going to say has already been said, but it's useful that we're reiterating and, and making connections across all the different presentations. So one of the things that I've been thinking about in my school is how we plan a coherent and cohesive writing curriculum. We're in the process of reviewing it because we've had uh, I started my job in September and we've had a number of staff changes. So we're thinking about how we can make our curriculum um, rich and robust um, so that we're delivering effective writing teaching across from key stage three to key stage four. I'm also now doing a new exam board, Educast. So I've had lots to think about in terms of what Educast want in terms of writing at the very end. The other things that have influenced what I'm thinking about has been uh, I've worked in a lot of schools where, uh, in special measures, an RI with high staff turnover, where planning the curriculum has been really tricky because um, we've not had this, the staff solidity to ensure that what's delivered is consistent across everybody. And a lot of it has been focused on catch up with year 11 and, and filling in gaps, you know, working with a deficit model. So what I'm able to do now is to start, step back and think, well, what needs to be in the curriculum for writing and how do we build that progression and use the curriculum model as progression has been said already. So it's been interesting to hear Zara on threshold concepts and really interesting to listen to Lindsay about what happens at key stage two and how we can build on that. So you'll see that as I go through the slides with what I'm going to talk about. So I was trying to make it a visual model here. So with, with key stage three, we're very much... It, it, I see it as a playground of possibilities. I think I've borrowed that quotation from someone, someone else. But with the key stage three, we've got freedom to really think about the writing curriculum and think about what types of writing we want students to be able to do in the different genres. And we need, but we also need, as Lindsay said, to think what do they already know from key stage two, and how do we build on it? You know, I, I echo what Lindsay said about as often thinking that maybe the um, the levels that we get from them in the past or the standardized scores are wrong or they're over scaffolded because what we when we get them we give them a completely different diet we don't have the same amount of time as primary teachers do and we and it's really hard to reinforce our writing expectations across a whole curriculum with a wide range of staff so one of the first things I think is really important is that everyone in the department understands what writing looks like at key stage two starting with the national curriculum and using those examples of expected and greater depth and analysing what it is that students are able to do and to use. And also be mindful that we've got at least a six week, six week gap uh, where students haven't been practising any of the curriculum because they've been at home and that we are then trying to meet them where they finished and move them forward. So I think it's really important that we think about all of the richness that we can put into the curriculum and think about um, where they need to be at key stage four. So that idea of looking at the expected standard and then looking at the key stage four outcomes and the MART scheme is really important. We definitely don't want to be teaching them GCSE writing and only working to those types of tasks in key stage three. So it's important that we think about what does writing look like and what 
do, what types of writing do we want in the curriculum and make use of, of, of three years we've got in terms of richness and diversity because at both either ends of, of their, their career the students are constrained by the end of end of key stage assessments so the first place I wanted to start um, is at granular level which a number of people have already spoken about and one of the things that I see has been has been problematic in a when we've been when I've been working in situations with deficit models is that students don't have security of grammar, sentence structure, punctuation, and vocabulary because they haven't had that layered and consolidated approach um, since they've entered school in year seven. They've had an inconsistent diet, and that leads to us doing quite a lot of short-term actions in key stage four. So when we're looking at the writing curriculum at our school. Um, this year, I've been thinking about where do I place the teaching of this in key stage three? Where do I need to work with year eight in terms of what they've missed in year seven, also with the pandemic? And what do we need to do in year nine to secure any to fill any gaps that they've had uh, in the previous years, the pandemic and also through staff turnover? So we're working with almost like three three layers of the curriculum at the moment, what year seven looks like, what year eight looks like and what year nine looks like. And then as we take year seven, current year sevens through, how we change the curriculum, adapt it to build on the foundations that they've had in year seven. So one of the things that I think students often feel insecure about is sentence structure. So within our curriculum, we're making sure that we're teaching sentence structure explicitly and uh, I will give a shout out to Lindsay's Crafting Brilliant Sentences, that, that, which has been invaluable to us, particularly looking at sentences at granular level with noun phrases and verb phrases and tenses. That's given staff a real solid aspect of subject knowledge to support them in the classroom and the resources are able to be adapted or taught discreetly depending on the class needs. And we've seen both, both of those happening in, in our department. So with the sentence structures, once students secure an understanding of what a sentence is and how they can manipulate it, it then enables them to write, uh, to use that in different genres of writing, both in fiction and non-fiction. So we're placing the uh, teaching of the sentence structure explicitly across all of our lessons and on our medium term plans. So looking at how we consolidate, uh, how we introduce the concepts of the sentence building on key stage two to then how we are sophisticated and able to manipulate them in key stage four. With sentence structure, it then thinks if we teach the shape of sentences. So we've been working with visual models, looking at the shapes of the sentence without any words in them and where the punctuation goes to try and help students um, acquire a concrete understanding of, of what can be an abstract con concept of punctuation, of where the punctuation goes to shape the sentence. And then we've been practicing manipulating the sentences by moving sentences around and looking at the different effects based on the text that we've been reading. So it's been interesting that Frey and I have both been doing introducing Greek myths as a, as a core unit in year seven. And with the Greek myths, we've been looking at the text structure, the genre, but also looking at the use of tense and sentence structures, because often the retelling of Greek myths for, for, for children have some simplified structures, which are then really clear. We can teach them really clearly to the students and then we can build on them in their next piece of writing when they move on into rhetoric. Um, we also then have explicit vocabulary teaching. Uh, our school has a word rich strand across every subject. So we look at explicitly teaching vocabulary um, by giving vocabulary lists, by identifying vocabulary in texts, um, pre-teaching vocabulary before we read so that students are constantly acquiring a wider range of vocabulary because not all of our students come from backgrounds where vocabulary is uh, centered in, the, in their lives and is, is something which they Talk, talk about and use, often we are introducing our students to a, a much wider range of vocabulary than they perhaps are used to using at home. Alongside that, we're then thinking about linking to sentence structure, what aspects of grammar do students need? And I've been influenced by uh, Deborah Myhill's Grammar for Writing project, which looks at the explicit but embedded teaching of grammar in the curriculum and I've used some of those units that are available on the university website on the Exeter University website 
to help us build that explicit teaching in our subjects. So we're very early stages because it's only February and this is a really big and significant piece of work for all of us. But we can start to see the impact at, at the moment. Year 8 are, I've been studying a unit on travel writing. So we've been looking at the genre specific features of, of travel writing right down to sentence level and doing a little bit like the talk for writing where we've asked them to mimic aspects of the text and they've been tracking so, for example, starting um, a sentence with three ing verbs, but when we talked about why they're there and how they use them and then how they might move them to different parts of the sentence later on. So they're practicing with real, real examples. And then they are then apply, expected to apply those in their writing through quite explicit teaching and the use of explicit success criteria so that they know what it is they've got to achieve by the end of it. And on Friday, period five, um, year eight were writing in silence for an hour and I was um, really pleased to see the impact of what we've been talking about um, in their books and they felt much more equipped to be able to write confidently because it, what, what we taught them was really hopefully really clear. So moving on so we're looking at the, the granular level and then oh, I'm rapidly running out of time so then the other thing that we're looking at our curriculum structure is the balance of fiction and non-fiction and how we're teaching transferable concepts across each of each of those two strands. So, so what you can see on screen there that it's about story structure and structure of nonfiction texts and different types of nonfiction, genre and genre features, clear understanding of what voice is in writing, and then how you use narrative voice then to create characters in fiction, and also how to create a persona who may not be you in nonfiction writing. And we look at all of those elements across every piece of reading that we do, a building across the curriculum, so that by the time they get to 10 and 11, they're able, they have those in the toolbox. So we aren't teaching, um, having to do emergency teaching in year 10 and 11, because these are going to be secure in the curriculum. But we're also mindful that some exam board expectations are quite narrow. So we do have to then later on teach towards the specific exam. So we've looked at other people have looked at curriculum sequencing as well. So this is kind of our visual model for how we want to go about making the teaching of writing clear and coherent and cohesive. That for each unit of work, we have all of those strands in there. But the big thing that I found that's helped me to be a better writer is understanding the art of rhetoric and how rhetorical structures appear across lots of different kinds of text. So if we root our teaching in the teaching of rhetoric from year seven, then I think we're equipping our pupils to be able to be uh, adept at writing in different genres as they get into, into key stage four and they're faced with those transactional and persuasive writing tasks that they have on the exam. But it's rooted in a really strong understanding of what rhetoric is and why we use it and the features of rhetoric. Um, then thinking about, uh, as lots of us have said today, the different kinds of knowledge we want with, we want in that. So for each unit, we have planned under these headings so that it's very explicit to staff what we want to teach. And then also then staff are freed up to think about how they want to teach it. And the other strand that runs alongside it is subject knowledge enhancement for everyone in the department is thinking about what do we know and how do we find out what people know, who's got expertise, who needs further support with teaching certain aspects. How can we share our good practice and how do we constantly develop our knowledge of writing? I think we're very good at enhancing our subject knowledge of literature, literature, literature texts, but we do need to think about our understanding of writing as a discipline and the different kinds of genres that we've got um, that we want to put into our curriculum. So things like travel writing is planned in. We're thinking about looking at detective fiction and we're also thinking about how we then look at poetry as a form of rhetoric so that then when that will enhance the when students are writing persuasively as well. So these are some questions that people might want to think about um, when you've gone away with all of the ideas from today in your head. So there's a few things there that people might want to think about. So that's everything that I've got to say on this for now. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And I hope that's been useful. Thanks so much for that, Mary. I think those questions at the end are really helpful for us. And I really liked as well that suggestion of making the abstract concrete with that shape of the sentence idea. So I'll <laughs> totally be stealing that one. Um, 
Our next presenter then is Laura Webb. Laura's done loads of English bits of CPD and she's going to be talking about key stage three assessments and thinking about hierarchical skills. So take it away, Laura. Sorry, Laura, I think you're just on mute at the moment. Yeah, that should be sorted now. Sorry, I was just trying to get the um, screen share sorted. Am I right to share screen rather than use the PowerPoint? Hopefully that will... Yeah, you should be fine to share your screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that okay. Perfect. Perfect, all right, I'll, I'll get talking then. So um, my name is Laura Webb and I tweet at Laura Lolder and I've over the years kind of tweeted quite a fair old bit about um, Key Stage 3 and um, kind of the development of the curriculum that I've done over the years and I want to talk today about something quite specific within 10 minutes so I'm probably gonna whiz through it super quickly um, but if you do have any questions feel free to tweet me and um, hopefully I kind of have condensed it down into 10 minutes. What I'm talking about is how this year we've um, moved towards treating skills in a very similar way to how we've been treating knowledge over the past kind of four years. Um, and this is quite a new thing that I'm talking about, so I don't have all the answers with this and how it's going to play play forward. But um, I thought it was useful to share today in a kind of 10 minute slot how it's going. So what I'm going to talk about is the issues that we had um, that kind of cropped up after we'd moved to a knowledge rich curriculum and had such a focus on knowledge. I'm going to talk about the discussions that came around how we could fix that issue and what we needed to actually do. And then I'll cover what the impact has been so far. But as I said, it's it's been in the works for a good year, but really this is the first year that we're, um, we've kind of implemented it across the curriculum. So the issues that we had, and I, I don't know whether how common these are across other departments. I mean, discussions I've been having um, with people, they seem to be kind of common. What, once we move to this kind of idea of this knowledge rich curriculum, which has been so valuable, obviously, and has had an impact on our results in the long term. What what happens is that you have to have a balance between knowledge and skills. They're not two separate entities. They're inextricable in so many ways. And if students are going to develop core knowledge, we also need them to develop the skills alongside them. And obviously, the knowledge lends itself to the skills. What we found is that knowledge became a core part of our curriculum and our assessment system. But we we've moved away from these kind of GCSE style assessments, but the teaching hadn't fully. Now there's no there's no blame to place there. I mean, even myself, um, even you know, with introducing all the changes, I still was kind of teaching paragraph structures at year seven. Um, and I think part of it was due to the fact that we targeted skills in a very broad sense. So we'd say this term we're looking at analysis. And that is just there's so much within that, that teachers are trying to teach so many different things at once. Whereas what we've done is we've built these building blocks of kind of knowledge in a foundational sense. And then we just said, and you're also teaching analysis. And it just wasn't working at the time. Now, these, like I said, <laughs> kind of those large skills across a term, um, it includes too much and it's too much for the students and it's too much to target when you assess. So. Another kind of you know thing that we were trying to look at is we were getting students to year 10 and 11 and we weren't having to any more teach them kind of how to identify word classes or you know what what key terms made up Freytag's pyramid. They knew all that, but they still needed to be kind of retaught some of the basics of inference skills and things like that, which we felt we've been teaching them for three years, but we've been teaching all those things all woven together at once. So we wanted to follow some of the principles that we were following with the knowledge instruction into the skills instruction. Now, I always talk about this book. Um, I had someone visit a couple of weeks ago and she said, I've always, I always hear you talk about this book. So uh, look, I've got it here. It's my Bible. Um, and I, I honestly would recommend this to any teacher, to any head of department. But a couple of the things that kind of informed how we would move away from that kind of teaching everything at once this is a paraphrase this isn't what um daisy put writes in the book but um there's an interesting blog on it as well if you want a condensed version 
I've mentioned it multiple times before, the idea of learning a subject being um, the same as training for a marathon. And I think when we teach students to write essays in year seven, we forget this and we aren't doing proper training with them. Uh, building the specific knowledge and mental models required for high level skill and in doing so focuses practice on tasks and activities that do not look like the final skill. So we've had to read extracts from this book with um, with the department to kind of talk about what that looks like, that it's OK if you're teaching selecting quotations, they might spend a lesson not selecting quotations, but they definitely shouldn't be, um, you know, analysing a simile. OK, and I'll kind of cover a little bit more about what that looks like. And this is another quote from the book on assessing inference. The activities that would help a pupil progress may not necessarily involve practicing inferences and imaginative insights. So when you're teaching um, inference, what um, Daisy goes on to explain is that you might spend a lesson looking at vocabulary because understanding of vocabulary is in, in, inherent in building and developing detailed inferences. So that's kind of some of the discussion that we've had. Now, the first, so what we kind of thought about is when we very first introduced kind of knowledge as a core part of the curriculum, we'd look at, right, what do, te what do students need in order to identify writers' methods? What core knowledge do they need? And we kind of break it down. So they might need word class terminology, understanding of sentence forms um, and sentence terms, and then language device terminology, right? And that's very broad. That still is an umbrella. So language device terminology that could include also could kind of be stranded out into a bigger pyramid of like figurative language and rhetorical devices, etc. But we hadn't done that with skills and we felt like that was something that was quite necessary. So I'll give you an example here. A01, if we're saying we're going to test students response to a text that in itself contains so much. Right. So they need to have basic comprehension, understanding of the explicit and implicit information in a text. They need to be able to select quotations and they need to be able to make clear points. And this became the three core skills that we taught across that we now teach across year seven. So in term one, the focus is solely comprehension. There's also writing skills linked, um, which also build in a kind of hierarchy. But. I don't have the time to cover all of that um, within the 10 minutes. I'm very aware of time. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about the middle strand there, the selecting quotations, because it's what I'm doing right now with year seven. Um, so when Donald talked earlier about a granular approach, and this is very similar to what we're trying to do with these skills. So what we spent a lot of time doing, myself and my second department, and then we asked um, the team to kind of check through and have a look at whether they felt it was appropriate, I think what we did is we broke down that individual skill of selecting quotations into the individual things that students needed to be able to do. This is really hard and it took a lot of time. I'll give you an example. At the most basic level, a student needs to be able to find the quotation from a text. Now, what we mean by that is literally just any quotation, no specifics. So that in itself, some students can't do because they look for speech. So that is the we think the foundational kind of building block then a relevant quotation find me a quotation about this character any relevant quotation no specifics okay then you build to finding a quotation to answer a closed question find me a quotation that shows that tells me something about this character's dog so that's much more closed or what color is the character's dog for example um and then you move on to selecting a quotation which supports a suggestion because there's more freedom there. Now, suggestion and inference is the first skill at the start of year seven as, as part of the implicit and explicit comprehension. So they should have already formed that skill. And then the quotation builds on the selecting, sorry, the selection of quotations builds on what they've already done. Find a quotation to answer an open question. What is the writer's viewpoint in this poem? Find me a quotation that proves what you think that is. Select quotation of an appropriate length. There's a lot of kind of consideration of how far down the scale that should go. Um, I think students can find quotations in all of those first five kind of grains without them being an appropriate length. They can still answer a closed question with a quotation and it, they might just pick a sentence, even though they probably only need a word. So that became a higher skill. A range of quotations to support a personal response. And then finally, valuable quotations, short, relevant, which support ideas, which is kind of an accumulation 
of all those other kind of granular skills. OK, this is just one example. We have nine of these for reading and nine of these um, for writing, where it's kind of tiered level um, of one specific skill. Um, and the idea then is that that then th kind of feeds into the way we teach. So we no longer teach kind of how to write a paragraph in year seven or year eight. Each term you're focusing on that granular skill, which may build on the previous skills in the same way that we teach knowledge of, you know, Freytag's pyramid in year eight, which builds on the things that they've learned in year seven. So an example might be, and this is the type of thing I've been doing this term with year seven, find me five quotations, which that is very specific to the skill of selecting quotations. They love this, give other students a clue. So I told them to just choose a random quotation and then give a clue to that quotation. And then they got to read out their clues and the other students had to find it. Really, that you'll never have to do that in an exam scenario. That isn't really selecting quotations, is it? But I just wanted lots of practice of skimming and scanning, which I think is a core skill within selecting quotations. So you're kind of like building the things that lend themselves to this, this kind of outcome. Find reference to, as I said, building the skimming. Find a synonym for has been quite useful in also developing their vocabulary. Um, so I might put a list of words on the board that are synonyms for words that I know are within a poem or a text that they're reading. And I'll say, find a synonym for big. And then they have to scan the text and they should be also, that should also be triggering all the different vocabulary around that word, which is something they'll have to do in an exam. So, you know, if in, um, you know, if you think to um, list four things in AQA, they will be given a topic, won't they? And then they're going to have to skim for the, the words as well. Where in the poem, so like another core part of selecting quotations is having fam familiarity with the sequencing of, of a text. So I might get them to number the stanzas and be like, where in the poem do you find this? And then they have to kind of track through. So they're looking at parts of a text. Students love proving teachers wrong. So I think this finds a quotation to prove I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so you just give them opposing things in the text. And then overall, you start to build to things like overall, what is this poem about? And you find three quotations to justify what you think. Um, so that's kind of the overall. And then the last thing I want to just compact, comment on is the impact we've seen so far, which, as I said, it is quite early days. So I'll probably talk about this at more length when we've seen a kind of cohort through a year at least. But increased understanding of a core skill across all abilities. So we're seeing students, especially our lower retainers, who would struggle to write a paragraph, essentially, because we're focusing on one thing. They're finding it much easier to just develop that skill, even if it with selecting quotations is just being able to select a quotation in response to a closed question, where some students are selecting three, three quotations for their response. You're still seeing that progress in all students, whereas before some students would just struggle to write a whole paragraph. Um, more focused lessons, which develop specific elements of skills, so on learning walks, etc. And teachers are talking more about, you know, how you approach those different kind of grains within um, selecting quotations and what, you know, what sort of tasks, what sort of activities will, will lend themselves to that. And then also reduce cognitive load for students. We're finding students, um, you know, are able to engage in these sorts of tasks a lot easier but, um, without kind of, there's no overload there. We're not saying to them, right. All we've done this whole term is look at a character now i want you to write an essay on that character and they don't really know what that means and that's me done hopefully that's about the right time i think i've gone over sorry thank you so much laura um again another useful presentation which has provided so much food for thought about the, the nuances of those core english skills um and again it seems <laughs> a crime almost that you would have a 10 minute slot but thank you so much for, for sharing so much in that 10 minutes thank, thank you so much for asking me <laughs> thank you um, and again no doubt um, people will be tweeting you their thoughts and their comments and their questions over on twitter too so thanks once again um, up next we have the wonderful jasmine lane who's returning to us um, jasmine did a, a presentation at last year's event online event and it was incredible i really enjoyed your talk last year Jan jasmine so i'm thrilled that you're returning this time around to talk to us about how you um, sorry to talk to us about how you've been introducing literary theory at key stage three so i'm really excited to hear about that cool all right just give me a second i'll share my screen Chrome tab. Okay. 
Okay, um, good morning everyone. Or oh, no, it's afternoon now. Um, so it's gonna be talking a bit about how I've been introducing literary concepts and critical lenses at Key Stage 3 um, at my school. Um, there's my Twitter handle and my blog, which has been a bit cut off, but okay. Um, so the first thing you may be thinking is just why would we do this given um, the government's uh, ideas about like impartiality and all these things when it, it can be kind of um, a bit like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know the word, but it's just like you may not want to because of the potential repercussions. But when I think about it, is I actually think about it in terms of backwards planning. So um, rather than just thinking what they need at GCSE, it's thinking about um, also what they might be doing at A level, but also just in the subject um, at, in general as well. So these are two of the assessment objectives from OCR, and one is demonstrating understanding understanding of the significance and influence of the context in which the texts are written and received. Um, and you also look at how that changes over time. So that necessarily is going to be looking at some of the political um, ideas that may have been at the time. And then AO5 is literally looking at how they are informed by different interpretations. So the idea of looking at how different people receive um, texts or how we might be able to look at them in multiple ways is something that um, I want to build into our curriculum. And this is specifically to my school. Part of our curriculum rationale is that we, um, we want them to be able to question, we want our people to be able to question the status quo. And so that means bringing in um, basically like uh, maybe controversial ideas and actually confronting them head on. Um, so that's that's how I thought about it. And one way that we can um, bring in literary ideas is to question narratives that we may have created um, ourselves. So here's an example. Um, I'm doing a kind of introduction to Gothic scheme for year seven. And these are some of the texts that I've done. And the first way that we approach it is just, you know, analyze the ways in which meanings are shaped in literary texts. So looking at inferences, you know, how the writer is creating a sense of fear and all of those basic things. But then when I was actually reading all of the texts back to back, I realized that the depiction of the women in many of the stories, um, other than the telltale heart, it depicted them in kind of the same stereotypical way. And then specifically in Lamb to the Slaughter, she actually used those stereotypes of like what women are supposed to do to her advantage. And so what I decided to do was because of that narrative that I made unintentionally, um, I added in like another lesson about how we're going to use how those stereotypes play a role in literature. And so what I did was, um, you know, after we read through and we have our base of knowledge and our comprehension, then it's kind of an extended do now, just getting them to think like, okay, in the story we read before, how did the landlady deceive Billy Weaver? And it's like the way that it was, because he was like, well, she's a nice woman. Maybe she lost a son. That's why she's being so caring to me. So he never thought like, oh, this woman is going to stuff me like one of her pets. Um, and so after I had them just think about like, what is your initial idea of why um, he was deceived, then this is for year seven, I say, okay, let's introduce the concept of a feminist lens. And so what I've done and what I have um, our teachers do is just like introduce the idea at a very surface level. Like this is year seven, I'm not gonna have them read Judith Butler, um, but just the idea of like, okay, let's look at how women are presented. Um, and so what we want to make sure that we do is, again, everyone's been talking today about a granular approach. Um, we can't do this at the exact same time. Like We can't just read this little context about the feminist lens and then right away, okay, now apply it to the text. Okay. Um, and so that task one, right after we read the context of literary criticism, um, is just what do all of these terms mean? And then we're gonna mind map it together. Okay, now go back and look at our story. How um, were some of the stereotypes um, that we applied to Mary? How are some of them used? And so some of the questions that I'll teach them and that was in the context is just like, you know, a feminist lens just questions these sort of things like how are women being um, shown? Like what kind of roles are they doing? Um, what's expected of them? Are they in stereotypical roles? So it was kind of, um, interrogating that, like, this is just what it is, um, and having them start to think about, like, okay, this is a, a conscious choice that the author made. Um, and then, again, in action is just modeling and practicing, like, this is how you would maybe incorporate this idea. So this isn't meant to be, like, you have to 
expertly apply the feminist lens, but it's just like, let's just try something. Um, what I'm trying to do at Key Stage 3 is kind of expose them to lots of ideas, not necessarily that they're going to become experts at it in one module, but that it's something that they can see like, okay, this is an interesting thing about English, so long term. Um, and then also just like pushing them on all of the vocabulary that we're learning that I explicitly teach over the course of um, a lesson is just really pushing them to like see how those those uh, tier two vocabulary terms can aid them in whatever their analysis is. Um, another way that we can do this is uh, incorporating ideas is to illuminate ideas that are already there. So uh, really easy um, one that we could all do with is Animal Farm. Um, obviously we can bring in some um, Marxist criticism and just kind of look at, you know, from a Marxist lens. But the first thing again, is just looking at what the text says what's the text um, doing right by itself. So nothing else, you know, the basic comprehension that needs to be there before we do anything else. And then the second lesson would be, okay, now let's read a little bit of context about Karl Marx and let's read a bit of text from the Communist Manifesto. And let's look at these, look, look at some images for the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? Um, I think there's actually a typo in that. So don't hold me to that. But it's about introducing small bits of these ideas rather than um, starting right at the beginning and saying, this is the Marxist lens, we're going to read the whole book through that, because you're sort of skipping a step um, that assumes that the pupils already have a comprehension of the basic plot. Um, and so, you know, we'd read a little bit from that. It's showing them again, like this is, you know, if you're gonna continue to study English, this is kind of what we do. And then it also builds up their sense that like, you know, I can do something really difficult. Um, it's actually went over really well. Um, the kids are like engaging with these ideas and thinking about how they apply throughout the rest of the text. Um, another way that I did this, this is from my year nines. Um, so, you know, two years into the curriculum where they've looked at lots of different ideas um, and different critical lenses is again, um, you know, looking at one of our themes, which was masculinity and control. So looking at just, just a base level, what do these stage directions reveal about Eddie as this new man comes into his house and kind of takes over control? So we do that. Um, and then I had students write about that. Just looking at what those individual words indicate about um, Eddie at that point in time. And so if you take you know, later on, I can send you these slides, but these are just a couple of examples where kids are saying, you know, he's trying to establish some dominance. He is, um, you know, by hoisting up his trousers, he's presenting this, this idea that he's in charge. And so that's just what's in the text. But then because I thought that that was such a key moment, that's when I decided, okay, now let's talk about social constructs because his idea of masculinity is the, con is the issue that's going on in the text. So then later we did another mini section where we read, um, I just wrote this up and took some things from online, but I introduced them to an actual philosopher, Judith Butler. And I said, so when we're looking at Eddie in this scene, he's performing his gender, which is, um, I told them what that means. I say, you know, we look at the scene again and the issue that's happening between Eddie, who is like a very stereotypical, like macho man, um, in the new man who's coming to the house, his issue is that his performance of gender is what's uh, what is um, you know causing conflict. So when we look at masculinity and control, it's the construction of that. Um, and so again, just defining terms, and then the same thing happens. So when we when we finish the text, um, we just had that one small lesson on introducing the theory. Again, we're not reading the rest of the text through this, but then kids were able to take those ideas and put them in, you know, how is masculinity shown throughout the text? Um, and this is another example. Um, you know, she says, uh, she says gender roles are, be are based off society. So this is, uh, shows a further loss of masculinity for Eddie when he's questioned. Um, so that is, you know, adding to their ability to analyze um, the ideas that are already there. But, um, you know, having them get used to the idea to bring in other critics to support whatever their interpretation is. Um, so that's just a few examples of how I've done it in year seven, eight, nine. It's still a work in progress. I've only been at my school since um, September, but um, it's going over really well. The kids are, you know, they, they're making really, really great progress and they're already incorporating it into their um, writing. And this is mixed ability. So everyone is learning the same stuff. 
Um, but a key point about these lenses, um, applying the lens or applying like, you know, like a writing with a lens should be separate from um, just teaching the text and like plot comprehension because it is a different set of knowledge. Um, applied comprehend, before you apply um, the lens, that comprehension needs to be established because if you just read it and then you go right into the lens, you are assuming that they already have comprehension of that plot. Um, and when you do that, you kind of make a, we can make a mistake and say like, why aren't they getting what's going on? Or you can already influence what they think rather than having them think about how it might apply. Um, and the key thing as well is that as we're introducing them over time, it should be introduced from a very surface level um, with the year seven feminist lens, just, you know, feminist lens means looking at how women are portrayed all the way through to, well, I mean, year nine is two years later, but saying, you know, Judith Butler has this concept. Um, so over the course, they'll continue to build up those ideas of being able to critique what is um, in society and also just in literature. Um, couple of cautions, interpretations and context. I already just said that again, it seems comprehension of the plot, can't just jump right in. Lenses are something that we apply, meaning that there's not only one way to read a text. Um, understanding literary theory is not the same as applying it. So like after I introduced the Karl Marx bit, um, I can't just assume that they're gonna be able to apply that to the rest of the text. It's just the introduction to here's some ways to think about it. Um, and then this is a final note. This is the same quote I said last year, but it just, it really does ground how I'm, how we're thinking about curriculum at our school. Um, there is no one grand narrative, simply a host of many narratives, each of which may have its partial truth. And so as we're, as you may be considering bringing in these ideas, as I'm, um, as the Key Stage 3 coordinator, bringing in these ideas, I'm realizing that each, each lens or each idea, each has its own little bit of truth. Um, and there is no, this is the right way to look at something. Uh, so thank you. And that's it. Thank you ever so much, Jasmine. Some really good practical tips there for how we can integrate that theory into key stage three. Um, passing on next then to our next session with Heidi, looking at Shakespeare and how we can start to think about what it looks like on stage, not just on the page. So Heidi, thank you. Hello, um, hopefully you can hear me and uh, see the slides. I'm not sure how I uh, click on at this point sharing them i think the slides on screen hi you just yeah try going on to the next one because i think the formatting looks a bit weird on the front one but hopefully it will just be the first slide. i can't see how i'm meant to move on with sharing them this way sorry that's all right i think are there some arrows there no uh, i can't see any arrows can you hover over the screen heidi near the bottom of the, the PowerPoint. Then you get an option to use the, the arrows. I can't, I don't have any arrows at all. No, that's fine. We'll just try removing your PowerPoint um, and uploading it again. Sorry. Uh, Lynn has just commented to say, just use the keyboard arrows. And that's, the keyboard arrow's not working for it either. Either. Um, okay. Shall I share my screen then? Yeah, do you want to try that? Yeah. Can everybody see that now? It might just take 30 seconds to, to come to us. Can people see my screen? Not yet. <laughs> Rachel, can you try uploading it from our end, perhaps? Right, can people see my screen at all? I can't see that at the moment. Heidi, but we're going to try and upload it from ah oh, there we go oh, right okay right i can't see what's going on i can hear you uh yeah. but I can see i've got arrows now so that's fine right anyway uh this is me um last time i ranted about shakespeare this time it's going to be a bit more practical so hopefully that will be helpful to people 
So as we all know, Shakespeare is central in the national curriculum. He's the only author mentioned by name who must be studied. He is compulsory. We must study at least two plays in Key Stage 3, and he is the only compulsory writer in GCSE. Uh, one of my um, Year 13s has been doing her EPQ on the teaching of Shakespeare, and uh, she was discussing about the outrage that went on when they were sort of redoing the national curriculum back in the 80s about the idea of cutting Shakespeare and everyone kicked up a fuss. Now, it is after him being out of the house the entire time, my cat has done his usual of appearing when I start presenting. So sorry about that. Right. So, um, yeah, we have to cover Shakespeare. Their experience at Key Stage 2 will have been different um, depending on their schools. A lot of our students come from an independent school background, so we have no idea what we're going to do on and we struggle to liaise with them. There is a way in which how we present Shakespeare makes it seem really, really difficult. And um, just got two uh, sort of statements about that. And this, this sense of awe that we have around Shakespeare can make it difficult to then access the language because we're pre-programmed to think that it must be difficult because it's this high culture thing. And so then our brain focuses in on the difficult and unknown language that's confronted but that confronts us. And so this concept of bardolatry is a real block when people first access Shakespeare. And we need to remove that block so that we don't have this situation whereby the students switch off at the start of key stage three and then hate it by the time we get to key stage four given that he's the only author that they're going to experience in this continually repetitive way. So how do we remove that block? We, we get practical because Shakespeare wrote plays. I mean, he also wrote poems, but we don't tend to study them at Key Stage 3 and 4. Some of you might study the odd one here and there, but we don't study his poetry in the same way we study the plays. So get practical about it because they have to talk about form and structure as we go on to explore them. So we need to focus on what that form is. And it's a play, not a book. It is not page bound. He didn't publish them in his lifetime. He didn't focus on the page. In doing this, we'll encourage automatically a discursive exploratory approach which does lead to us reducing the stakes when we explore the aspects of the play. If we're approaching it practically, if we're not putting things down on paper, it becomes less high stakes. And it also enables us to check for understanding in a really immediate formative way. Sorry, the cat's determined to make an appearance. And through doing so, it encourages us to look at how the students can link language and structure to meaning, which is something I find they often um, struggle with, particularly with structure. And you'll get these horrible points in writing that are just added on where they say something random about structure because they've spotted something structural, no idea why it's there. And so they just whack it in. And it's, it's worse than pointless because it wastes their time. Uh, and also, when we get into the plays as a play, it encourages whole text thinking and how everything works together and why things happen when they happen and not at another point. For example, I mean, many of you will be aware that I'm obsessed with Act 4, Scene 3 of Macbeth. But why does that scene happen then at that precise point? It could happen in terms of plot in several other locations. Why does it put it there? Thinking about the text as a whole. But this is all things you'll have heard me say before. What does that mean? What are these things that I go on about all the time mean? It means that we don't get their exercise books out. We put the exercise books away. We focus on the text. We explore the text and we, we, we make it live. Because alongside that old, old English, nothing gets my heckles up was going Shakespeare wrote in old English um the verse structure is a barrier and Shakespeare knows this as we can see from Act 5 scene 1 of Midsummer Night's Dream where he takes the mickey out of people who read verse badly how do we get over this one you must model good practice you must read verse correctly out loud uh you must give them examples of verse being read out loud um 
Ben Crystal has some excellent videos of um, Shakespearean verse delivery in original pronunciation that are worth a, a, a watch. Um, and also, correct, without judgment, it should be non-confrontational every time verse is read. A, so that it doesn't make a big deal any time you correct verse reading, uh, but also so they get used to the fact that it's fine to make mistakes, but you've got to get this verse reading right. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Don't ask students to sight read long speeches individually. It's really, really hard. Uh, I don't like doing that, so I'm not going to make them doing it. Um, another low stakes thing that you can do as a group read is to ask the class to read to punctuation and then switch reader at the punctuation mark. And they can get some really interesting conversations going around. What um, other more practical things, and uh, my first uh, plug here is for um, Rex Gibson's fabulous resource, Shakespeare's Language from Cambridge University Press, which as you can see is as old, older than my teaching career. Um, with this, you use a re reduced version of Act 1, Scene 1 of The Tempest to look at the effect of establishing setting and themes in this beginning and how this is achieved. Again, you would do that read around to the punctuation, the circle, so you can see how the punctuation uh, and how this is delivered and this continuing abruptness creates a sense of panic within the scene. And it becomes very, very clear uh, in a way that just looking at the words on the page wouldn't be for many key stage three students. And it enables you to do that. Uh, it shows how authority is challenged through the scene. So you can see and hear that the lower class characters have more things to say than the, the higher rankings. And it, you can discuss how the illusion of a ship in a tempest is created merely through words. And again, think about why open a play in this way, relating it to teasers and the establishment of themes and fun. Although this is one that you either have to book a space out for or, or go outside for, move the tables to the side for, which again will make them think Shakespeare is fun just because it's different. Um, sorry, I'm aware of time, so I'm going rapidly through. Now, investigating character through archetypes, this sort of builds in on some of the things people have been talking about lenses, and this is quite an, um, sort of an early modern actor lens to approach these, these things. And um, this comes from activity at the globe that you can expand to take up hours and do in different ways, uh, because you've got, a comp you've got four main archetypes of character, your ruler, your warrior, your carer, and a trickster. You discuss these and you demonstrate a physical representation. The ruler has his elbows out at right angles, making a crown on their head uh, and has to imagine a long train behind them. A warrior has a shield and carries a high sword. A carer is open to everyone, so doesn't protect their heart. A trickster can choose to conceal or reveal himself. And you talk about how those are archetypal characters. Um, and then you ask the students to walk around the room in those, talk about the associations that we have with them, how walking around in that character makes them feel, talk about maybe which one they're feeling most like right at that moment, and then think about what elements characters in your play demonstrate. And that's an interesting point because that's where they can start to realise that characters change over the course of these plays and develop arcs, particularly our main characters. Uh, um, Romeo is a really good one to look at um, through these uh, uh, figures, as, as indeed is Macbeth, and it gives them a language and a way of expressing quite complex ideas um, through this. And again, through doing it in a more drama lesson-y type way, it reduces that um, sort of, oh my God, I'm writing about Shakespeare, I'm analysing his character. Uh, and it does open up really interesting conversations. Um, this one, I think I learnt uh, this particular approach with the RSC and the Prince's Teaching Institute, but it could have been done at the Globe. Um, and it's a good idea. It's, it's a really good one to do with Macbeth before you start studying it, to give it insight into how his character will develop over the course of, of the play. Uh, and so you've got two rows facing each other. Uh, you don't tell the sort of early Macbeth or late Macbeth which one they're going to be. And then you repeat those phrases from either the beginning or the end and you talk about 
how that feels hearing those words about you uh, and, and what sort of person would be like how do you get from one point to the other and again at this point you're then talking not just about character art but but possible plot development how does this play work how do we get from brave Macbeth to this tyrant that people execute and so it's again it's about breaking down that barrier that this is Shakespeare high culture I don't know what to say it doesn't say anything to me um this this final one is is something that I used to really be against looking at meter I, I was like oh it's just really dull um but actually I did this at the globe on um, Macbeth soliloquies and I found it really really interesting particularly because it enabled me to finally be able to say something intelligent about uh sort of meter and the structure of meter uh so you, you need graph paper uh and that's always uh sort of something you need to ask the math department for and you plot whether a line is full iambic pentameter whether there's one beat too many and one beat not enough and it gives you a kind of emotional heartbeat of a soliloquy and so this is a stage where we're moving from a practical activity to a more page-based analysis but what you're doing there is showing to the students how Shakespeare disrupting his iambic pentameter gives clues to actors on how they're meant to be delivering those lines how they're meant to be feeling and um, there's some lovely moments in Romeo and Juliet, Romeo's heart skipping a beat and things like this. Uh, but in Is This a Dagger I See Before Me, you can see visually when you plot that how Macbeth is struggling with this idea of what he's planning to do. And when, particularly when a lot of the language in the soliloquies is complex uh, and sometimes repetitive, it's hugely referential and to uh, key stage three classes can seem far too dense to, to even begin to work out its individual word meaning, you plot, plot it in this way and they can track the emotional path of it, at which point they tend to believe me more when I say they don't need to understand every word that Shakespeare is saying uh, because they really, really don't. Um, and all of these things will then uh, sort of feed into and develop written analysis because you will have had this rich conversation about how things are put together as a play before you even begin to put anything on the page. And so when I teach key stage three Shakespeare I do try to focus on practical approaches um I don't read around the class in a in a hideous um old school fashion partly because nothing winds me up more than students sight reading verse badly uh, but also that is if you read any research into people's experiences of Shakespeare in school, it's preci precisely that page bound reading around the class that people remember not fondly. It is that which puts people people off struggling over words and meanings they don't know. And it results in the sort of Shakespeare that uh, Cohen mentions. Um, now I can't. I've, I don't know if I've talked too long or, or not enough yet. Um, I've probably rabbited on far too quickly. Uh, but the resources that I, I use when I'm teaching Shakespeare uh, for for everybody, um, the I, obviously the national curriculum is there in place. But Shakespeare's Language by Rex Gibson. It's a collection of photocopy resources, which uh, effectively those of you that don't have a drama background or don't or aren't confident in drama-based, uh, uh, sort of stage-based uh, activities, uh, really will scaffold for you. Uh, and it's got everything in it, and um, that's photocopyable. The Cambridge School Shakespeare, they are not just for the students. The activities in there are always intermixed with practical approaches as well as page-based. The RSC's Shakespeare's Toolkit is amazing. Um, obviously, for preference, go and get some training from the RSC. The toolkit book is significantly cheaper. 
And there's lots of good stuff with the Arden. I'm always going to plug an Arden book in probably every presentation I ever do. This time it's The Turn of Shakespeare and How to Cure It by Ralph Allen Cohen, uh, a real call to arms of um, Shakespeare teaching. Uh, the North Face of Shakespeare is a teacher book in the Cambridge School Shakespeare series that is also uh, well worth your reading. And um, that is kind of me done and wrapped up, if if that's OK, people. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Heidi. And I think like that, those resources are really helpful. And also the nod, to, I think, to those Ben Crystal videos, his reading of the Shakespearean mm -hmm. sonnets, I'm a big fan of as well. And um, passing on then to Rachel, who's going to be looking at how we scaffold rather than differentiate within English to establish those high expectations for all. Super. Thank you, Richard. So um, talking about scaffolding rather than differentiation, I think is so important because if we think about what we want our key stage three curriculum to be, the most important thing is that all students are able to access and engage with those concepts and ideas that we believe passionately are at the forefront of the curriculum that we are offering. So I think the first thing that to start with is that mindset matters. When we have students in front of us, it's very easy for us to refer to students in subcategories and groups. And we often may talk about low prior attainers. And while low prior attainment in itself is genuinely a matter of fact, someone may have previously um, performed poorly in an, a test or an assessment, I think it's really important that as teachers, we consider that that, that snapshot of attainment is not necessarily reflective of what that student will be capable of in the future, or perhaps what they were truly capable of of in the past. And there's a fantastic quote on the bottom of the screen there, which I think really sums up that idea that it cannot predict an unwritten future and that we have to have an open mindset of what all students in front of us can achieve when they are in our classroom and have those high expectations for all. On the same point of mindset, I think it's really important that the idea of, I saw this on Twitter actually, the idea that SEN and low prior attainer are not interchangeable terms. Now we know that, um, however, sometimes those terms are used um, and almost grouped together as, as the same thing. And whilst a barrier to learning is a barrier to learning, it doesn't necessarily need to be automatically linked to knowing and learning less because our idea should be rooted in overcoming that barrier for that student. So what I want to talk about today is why I think that actually differentiation and offering students something different isn't actually the way to move forward with our key stage three curriculum and the idea that our key stage three curriculum should offer the same texts, the same ideas and the same concepts to everybody. So in our differentiation as a term it is something that is rooted in good intentions. It has the idea that we would give something different to the students who need something different. But actually, those students who are falling behind in our curriculum need more of that curriculum to catch up to the point where they need to be rather than needing less of it. And often um, this idea of system over sense, the idea that if somebody is um, falling behind, we would offer them something different. That's not gonna catch them up on that path. It's simply gonna send them down a different traje trajectory. And that idea actually that our students um, have a right to access the texts and the literature that we are all engaging with. And we don't, I think it's almost an injustice if actually past um, past poor attainment or past low attainment then results in a re reduced diet for the future. So I think it's really important that we consider when we're planning these wonderful curriculums and these fantastic ideas that are rooted in this whole idea of a knowledge rich curriculum that we ensure that that's open and accessible to all. Um, this is just a quote from the Chartered College of Teaching. Now, what they are talking about here is differentiation, and they say that adaptive teaching is less likely to be valuable if it causes a teacher to artificially create distinct tasks for different groups. And I think the key word there really is artificially, and that idea that simply offering something different isn't necessarily going to mean that that student is able to catch up and make that leap. 
So uh, one thing I would say, um, a lot of my experience has been working with low prior attainers or nurture groups, and it is really important to proceed with caution. It's, it's fantastic to have the idea that all students can do the same and that we shouldn't differentiate for them. But if we must have a different option to differentiation and we must ensure that we are going to make the curriculum accessible so we have to do something different but we have to ensure that the core values of the curriculum remain the same and I think that's really where scaffolding comes in and the idea that scaffolding is the solution because it's naive to assume that the solution is simply doing more of what we already have done if that hasn't worked but it's also wrong to assume that the solution is offering them some different so then they by consequence don't have access to that curriculum so I think that's why scaffolding really fits perfectly into the middle there so uh, the model I like to deploy for scaffolding in the classroom is a um, path of what would always be the same but what might occasionally be different so in terms of things that would always be the same I think it's really important we always have the same text and the same literature and that that's actually in terms of both quantity and quality so not only are they studying the same book but they are getting access to reading the whole of the book looking at the book in its entirety and that if it was a short stories or extracts based unit that they are exposed to the same number of short stories and extracts and the same ones as their peers I think it's really important that the key concepts and knowledge that have been mapped out as being central to building the foundations for key stage four remain the same and I think expectations of what they should achieve, there's a, a fascinating bit in the Michaela School book where it talks about what you see in a top set should be your expectation for your bottom set. And I, what I, I thought about that, and it's interesting to consider if we think about quality, that expectations around the quality of work, even if it's perhaps of a smaller quantity would be a really positive thing to aim to always keep the same but of course there may be things that might be different and there have to be things that would be different but it's important that this is around scaffolding and supporting students rather than offering them a different diet so we have to fill in pre-existing gaps of knowledge we cannot build new knowledge on wobbly foundations we have to have um, an increased focus on the key knowledge because it, we have to ensure that they encode that knowledge that is essential for them in their long term memory. So we have to repeat and revisit this knowledge to ensure that they are secure in these, this new knowledge and that it's linked directly to the knowledge, the pre-existing gaps that we've hopefully filled in. And everything needs to be incremental. I think it's really important to remember that the goal is static until you've reached it. You cannot move on to a new goal until you've reached the prior one, previous one in a sequenced curriculum. So that idea that the goal is static until you've reached it, it really allows that idea of building up in small steps for these students. If that ultimate goal at the end of Key Stage 3 is writing an analytical essay, the small steps you can take to reach that can be really powerful if taken um, in small small chunks and built upon gradually, ensuring the students have understood those at each point. So I think it's also important to note that scaffolding is temporary in a way that differentiation isn't. If we offer somebody a different curriculum, that's a permanent decision. But if we offer somebody a, um, if we offer students an incremental approach to reaching that end goal, then that's a temporary measure in which they are then able to reach that end goal. So I think that's really important. And I think definitely when we're thinking of equity of provision, perhaps taking content at a slower pace and catching up on content previously made or previously not cemented in our in their minds is is a temporary solution to ensure that they are able to catch up to their peers in a way that actually offering a different curriculum isn't and offering a different curriculum is a permanent decision to offer something different 
I've got some examples of student work. I am conscious of time here, um, so I'm just going to run through these quite quickly. But these are examples of student work from our, our lowest um, sets and students who have previously underperformed in assessments and tests or performed below average in assessments and tests. And these students are demonstrating um, a really strong knowledge of plot and context in these. And they are able to link to other ideas previously taught. And their writing skills, they are able to write at, uh, at length and in detail about the topic at hand. You can see here this is an improved paragraph on Romeo and Juliet and the theme of love and hate. Now that paragraph actually took weeks to get to that point. That was around the fourth redraft of that paragraph. However, that's a really high quality, that's a really high quality piece of writing that actually it doesn't matter that it took a little longer to get there because the quality of the end product is at the same level. So in an English classroom, I just think there are three key things to what scaffolding might look like. There's the idea that we must identify the core knowledge of what they need to know and what they have perhaps not brought forward. What core knowledge have they not brought forward? What is missing? And I think it's really important that all of those all of that knowledge is the focus of our lessons. We can't afford to waste time or focus on um, different aspects or additional aspects if that's the core knowledge that's going to then allow them to progress further through the curriculum that's the core knowledge that we really want to focus on and we want to teach it but we want to repeat it and we want to have that constant recall coming back to it I think it's really important that we map out how the text will be at the heart of every lesson for these students I think it's really important that we consider that we don't want to read to these students less. We don't want to expose students to a reduced diet of literature simply because um, they need a little bit more support to access it. Actually reading to them and helping them to understand the text and empowering them to um, engage with those texts will improve their English skills and a in a way that a diminished diet wouldn't. And finally, I think when it comes to writing, we really have to break it down and it's scaffolding for all students. We need to be explicit about the individual components of what we want the end product to look like. And we really need to focus in on those skills and building those up gradually, because one articulate point that is a really successful way of communicating an idea is a much better basis for knowledge than having done five of a poor quality. So I think it's about actually taking a slower pace, but making sure that what the end product is gradually built up to something of a really high quality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Sorry for the echo. She's actually sitting next to me. <laughs> You're supposed to turn your speaker off, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. So Rachel's actually been running the themes behind, uh, running the tech behind the themes today. And then she's also just delivered a very inspiring presentation on having high expectations for all at Key Stage 3. So impressive effort. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, up next is Asad, who is uh, going to be talking to us about having a granular approach to analytical writing. And that has been one of the key threads running throughout the event today, looking at the curriculum and also our teaching on a granular level. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this next one. And I can see you have the slide ready to go. Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, right, I'm going to put a little timer on because otherwise I will just blabber on. Um, right, so I'm going to be looking at granular approach for writing. So um, actually, we've been set up really, really well because a lot of people have sort of touched on the importance of embedding procedural knowledge throughout the curriculum. So um, this, this was some of my reasoning for um, presenting this talk today. So I wanted to uh, present this talk because I thought that actually there's a lot of value in looking at how to uh, break down analy analytical writing into a more granular form because it helps pupils to develop uh, a sophistication, okay? It gives them different tools which they can then use to express themselves. 
um, especially pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds, those with English as a second or um, additional language. Um, uh, it removes barriers to self-expression, okay, advantages, again, people from disadvantaged background, but also um, SEND as well. I know that there were some concerns perhaps that actually um, not all of these things necessarily um, are geared towards those with um, SEND, but actually this is something that I use all the time uh, with, you know, with my top to bottom groups and it works really, really well. Uh, and finally, just uh, a little takeaway as well. It does actually make target settings so much more succinct as well and clear. I think what Lindsay was talking about um, earlier in terms of um, having that kind of primary school approach of imitating um, and having a really slow granular approach, um, it really helps to kind of break down your marking load and helps the pupils to have really clear targets to focus on for their writing as well. Right, so this was based on some of the um, research around memory by the EEF. Um, I won't necessarily read out all of it just because I am quite conscious of the time, but essentially um, the EEF spoke about the fact that actually writing is a really, really complicated process. I think when we initially uh, become English teachers, um, we... Uh, initially coming into the profession, we often forget how complicated it is and the processes we've had to go through in order to learn how to be able to write or to comment on things. Um, and therefore, um, when we come into the classroom, that becomes quite a daunting prospect when we have to break that down to pupils. Um, so uh, primarily, I'm going to focus on focusing on the different strategies that I use um, to help break down analytical writing. Now, firstly, um, as lots and lots of people, um, including Lindsay, for example, earlier, spoke about how we have to break down the writing process across the curriculum. Um, OK, because obviously, I think, um, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Laura spoke about knowledge earlier and how, um, you know, we've had a huge focus on teaching knowledge. But actually, the procedural knowledge is just um, as just as important as the powerful knowledge and needs to be taught in a really careful, precise way as well. Now, this is not something exact. This is not the exact sort of curriculum that uh, we use in my school. Um, this is just an example of the way in which you might break down the different skills. So you can, you can see a lot of the, um, the bulk of the skills are sort of um, taught in year seven. And then obviously they'll be um, repeated and practiced across the keys. Uh, across key stage three as well, and then beyond key stage three. Um, so just moving on from that, now I wanted to use a question as a focus. Um, so for example, you may be looking at The Tempest as a text. So um, I know that Elaine spoke about um, teaching The Tempest and she had some really fantastic ideas. We also teach The Tempest in my school um, in year seven. Now, this might be a, con um, a question that you might look at so how does Shakespeare present conflict in Tempest? OK, and here is a speech from Prospero where he talks about um, what Antonio did to him uh, back in Milan. OK, and um, he paints a picture of his character before Antonio has had a chance to speak. Now, I highlighted some phrases. OK, and um, so you might do this as part of your um, annotations in a class. OK, you might highlight quotes under a visualizer with pupils. So just looking at that, the yellow phrases, for example, so perfidious, false uncle, secret studies, or links to um, Antonio. Um, and there is a conflict in the way Prospero presents himself. So he says, I loved, I was the prime duke, I was so reputed. Um, there's dignity and all my study and things like that. Okay, so there's a real conflict in the kind of Dukes um, Prospero and Antonio were. Now, how do you get the pupils to then write about this? Now, um, again, uh, for some reason, I'm not able to make the animations work. However, the knowledge is still there. And hopefully this will be um, useful for you. Now, um, we started teaching last year in my school creative writing through um, sentence structures and formulas. And that made me think about, well, why don't we break that down for analytical writing as well? And this is just an example of something that I developed and um, that I thought that we could use um, and is now used really successfully in our school um, to teach uh, topic sentence writing. So it might include something like, oh, you know, I want you to use a, a transitive adverb or a transitive 
transition phrase, uh, a head noun, a positive analysis verb with a main clause, a prepositional phrase, uh, and embedded quote. And they're in a particular order as well. Now, when you module that for pupils, it might look like um, might look something like this. So undoubtedly, the fraternal conflict, which may be a piece of vocab that you have taught as part of your curriculum, um, a fight between brothers drives the main action within the Tempest, since Prospero, the prime duke, feels betrayed by the perfidious Antonio. Now, that's really, really complex. But actually, if you break it down like that, that, you know, I want you to include those uh, components, then the pupils should hopefully be able to imitate that same thing as well. Now, a couple of things. So obviously, this is a, um, so I use this all the time, it is a very good uh, process. However, you might find that actually, it's maybe too structured, and doesn't allow pupils, um, you know, to write in different ways. And obviously, not all of their ideas can be conveyed through this one sentence structure. Now, um, it ensures that there's a high level of detail provided, even if it's forcefully. However, it might sound a little bit clunky. Okay, It might not necessarily even sound natural. Um, so now this is something that I have since moved towards um, as a way of helping them being able to write topic sentences. So I might give them the head noun. So say, for example, our head noun might be the key phrase that they've learned, fraternal conflict. And then I might just list um, all of those other grammatical features that I then want them to use in their writing. And I would model that first. So for example, I might model that same sort of sentence. So in contrast to Ferdinand and Miranda's love, the fraternal conflict between Prospero and Antonio drives the main action of the uh, play. Since Prospero, the embittered prime duke, wishes to gain back his power from the perfidious Antonio. Now, also, you can kind of see that actually, um, we've now embedded a quote in the appositive, okay, so they can kind of see that actually, oh, okay, these things are actually more fluid rather than um, used something in isolation. Um, I really like this method. I use this all the time. Again, it's really, really successful, um, only because it, you know, it not only gives them a really clear success criteria, it gives them some flexibility as well, whilst also ensuring detail, okay? The only con here is, if pupils are not sure about each of the components, um, they may attempt to use all of those in order, a little bit like the formula in, on the previous slide, um, in which case it will, their writing might just become clunky again, or again, they might just be adding things, or for example, they might just add a prepositional phrase for the sake of adding a prepositional phrase without it having any value. So what do you do about that? Now, um, I will come back, I will come back um, to that again. So um, moving on to the how section of a paragraph, for example. So if you're looking at language analysis, now this is something that's really important as well. Now, going back to the um, thing that, that the EEF said, um, the fact that actually writing is a really complicated process. So I realized that actually I'm you know, I'm maybe get I'm giving my pupils the skills. However, what they are using the sentence structure correctly. However, what they're actually saying in that sentence isn't necessarily accurate or of any value. So what I started doing, I started thinking about, well, why is it that they aren't able to do that? And I started giving them some knowledge. Now, this may be in the form of, you know, um, phrases in the bullet point, or maybe even just keywords, like the example on the screen now. So, for example, you might just give them keywords that they have learned. So, the word duplicitous, fraternal conflict, and betrayal, okay? And then you might give them the skills with some vocab in the brackets as well. And all they have to do is try and construct that sentence using those skills, okay? Whilst not necessarily having to work so hard to retrieve the knowledge, okay? Because they're already, their brains are working already so hard in constructing the sentence. They, you don't necessarily want to put a, sorry, I've always threw, uh, the timer did go off. Um, but you don't necessarily want to overload them by giving them loads uh, of other things to think about as well. Um, now, again, just breaking down even further. So I started to realize then after that, that actually pupils have generally got a really good grasp of how to write a really good sentence. However, some of their phrases are not necessarily being utilized in the best way. So I started breaking it down even further. So um, 
I started, I just introduced maybe three non-finite verbs, so non-finite participle phrases, reflecting, echoing, and mirroring. I gave a really succinct um, explanation of it. You know, it's a verb, which is not the main verb. It's an extra bit of knowledge or whatever you want to call it. Okay. And this was a way of um, helping them be able to link their analysis and the author, um, uh, the author's intent in there as well in that same sentence. Okay. Sorry, just whizzing through again. Now, again, you might also, um, with another group, okay, who might not be very confident with even writing phrases, you might even break it down further to um, something with multiple choice, where you give them a sentence, but they have to select the subordinate clause that might go in there. So say, for example, I've got relative clauses there. So I've got three relative clauses about Prospero. So Prospero, who utilized Ariel to create amazement, which utilized to create uh, amazement, and that which uh, utilized to create amazement. Now, um, obviously, the correct answer is who. And then you can have really important discussions about why the other two aren't correct. Well, Prospero is a human. OK, so hence, we should use who. Um, Right, this was another piece of homework that I produced in the first lockdown, and it you know went down an absolute treat. Um, so getting them to practice non-finite um, phrases again, but in the form of a paragraph, so where they have a paragraph, but they have to enhance it by inserting um, non-finite phrases using their knowledge of the text and you know all the knowledge that they have learned in their class time. Right, so I wanted to just show you the effect really quickly of um teaching in this particular way um now without profiling um pupils um you know this by no means you know this is not this uh pupil's capacity but um this is a pupil from year 10 this pupil is targeted a grade two okay and you know they have a really severe form of autism as well okay they can read really really well but actually even some of the more simple words they struggle to understand however they had a really good go at being able to write um I've been able to write a paragraph. Sorry, I can just see the timer. And, um, you know, you can clearly see that this strategy works. I won't go through it now. Now, um, there are some pitfalls to it as well. So some of the pitfalls are the fact that you might um, remove scaffolds too early. You might introduce too many gramma grammatical units with, while refining um, the use of each of these as well. Now, the important thing um, to do here is to constantly model in the I do, we do, you do format, okay, and to practice those things in isolation as well. So maybe if a formula is too overwhelming for them, just break it down to the, you know, the basics, right? Let's just work on a positive. Let's just work on non-finite phrases, okay? Um, providing word banks, okay? If you've not really explained what a verb means, okay, they're never going to be able to um, understand how it's used. For example, you might give them suggests, evokes, illustrates, but actually all of those an analysis verbs are entirely different uh, and have entirely different uses, okay? And therefore, it needs to be broken down and just give them a couple um, that are maybe synonym synonyms of each other that they can then use um i am nearly finished rich um right there you go finally the key takeaways guys so uh, obviously break it all down okay introduce pupils to various sentence forms and explore how these may be used for analytical purposes separate knowledge and skills so if they are practicing the skills just give them the knowledge okay um model how these are used okay to weave together analysis analysis and context and they will do a really really good uh, job of it. Okay, right, there you go. <laughs> Sorry for, for running over a little bit. Oh, I can't hear you at all. I was muted there. Thank you so much for that. That was really useful in terms of like those frames. And I really like the like different options for making something that, like you said, could be quite rigid and um, quite flexible. So it like links in a lot with what Rachel was saying about the different levels of scaffolding too. So thank you so much. And um, what thank you. we're going to do next is moving on to, again, thinking about sentences um, and a kind of sentence curriculum, if you like, um, with this recording that Kate McCabe has put together for us um, as our penultimate I session. Can't, um, but I did want to... And we should have that any moment now. Hi, my name is Kate McCabe. Uh, I'm also known as Even Better If, 
Um, I'm really sorry I can't be with you there today uh, at Teach Me English Icons, um, but I did want to share with you my presentation anyway uh, and talk about the work I did a few years ago on developing a sentence curriculum at Key Stage 3 to 4. Um, now, uh, I think the curriculum at uh, Key Stage 3 is one of the most fascinating things in any school. Uh, I think it's also slightly terrifying because I think the capacity to get it wrong is huge. Um, and um, that's largely because what it could look like, the permutations, the, the variations are endless. And I think we're at risk of majorly overcomplicating that uh, curriculum um, when really essentially what we're trying to do is to make students um, become better writers, better readers, better speakers. Um, and of course implicit in that is uh, for them to become more fluent thinkers, which uh, comes from that deep engagement with texts and with ideas and with uh, story structures and characters and so on. Um, so why sentences? Well, uh, for me, I think um, sentences is, is a really important part of uh, what students have to do, uh, Key Stage 4, 5, beyond. Um, but it's often one of the things that uh, we, we don't necessarily pay quite as much attention to as vocabulary, uh, knowledge of the content, how to answer the question, uh, how to write to time and so on and so forth. Yet we know if any one of these kind of elements uh, in writing is, uh, if the kind of foundational knowledge of any of these elements is missing, we know that um, writing can be you know, dramatically slowed or even halted. So uh, for me, it's, it's as important a part of uh, what we need to be doing with students as um, is a how to answer the question or uh, what the internal structure of the text type is and so on. Um, I also think a sentence curriculum is really important because we know there's there's such a difference between key stage two and key stage three and we get that loss of drafting um, from one key stage to another which I think has a real impact on students. I think we can sometimes have a tendency to sort of skate over the surface of um, of text and focus on story or focus on character but not necessarily the the mechanics of um, how that's done. Um, I also think uh, sort of going back to key stage four uh, we've all experienced that that thing of trying to shoehorn in sentences uh, whilst teaching students about um, answering questions or whilst teaching them about uh, text uh, and I gave a uh, professional development session in my school the other day on revision and how um, uh, one of the kind of pitfalls of revision is that often we're trying to teach students new content at the same time as we're trying to ask them to revise um, and I, I, I've certainly been guilty of, of trying to get them to practice uh, writing exam questions and making them chuck in specific sentences at the same time. Um, but for me, this is probably the most powerful reason why we should develop a sentence curriculum. And this is from Daniel Willingham. And he says, readers hold the idea of the sentence in their head and then discard the sentence uh, and the particular words. Um, and I think it's, um, it's this that is actually the reason why we need to teach sentences, that um, we need to teach students that sentence holds an idea and that the more powerful the sentence, the more impactful the sentence, um, the longer that that idea will resonate and, and linger in the mind of the reader. And, and actually it's the sentence that has the potential to communicate and convey um, what that idea is and 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 the difference between you know one sentence and another sentence is actually really about ideas um so what does that look like uh in reality um so this is the sentence curriculum um that i developed the, these are the sentences in year seven eight and nine i will put all of these resources and make all of this available um, i stole sentences from uh, so many different sources from alan peach from um, exemplars from exam materials uh, and put them all together in terms of whether i thought they were 
uh, more suitable to fiction or to non-fiction uh, texts and analytical texts. Um, then I mapped them to our, our scheme of work at the time um, across 7, 8 and 9 to our curriculum um, and uh, mapped them in terms of which ones I thought we could use and embed into our assessment tasks and into our um, uh, resources. Uh, most sort of suitably and appropriately. Um, so this is a, an example of Beowulf, a Year 7 uh, Unit 1, and this is part of a mini scheme within the, the bigger scheme of Beowulf. This is where we uh, come away from um, uh, sort of the Seamus Heaney uh, translation and we have a look at this um, Rosemary Sutcliffe uh, Dragon Slayer version. As you can see, it's it's really lovely, rich, rich language uh, that can be unpicked. Um, and when we've read that with students, then uh, teachers will do some sort of comprehension and uh, other works of digging down vocabulary work, digging down into the um, into that text, um, making sure that they understand it on a on a sort of literal level. Um, and then we start to isolate and identify those key sentences and, and we'll get students to think about um, going back to Willingham, the sort of the power of the idea, what is the power of the idea that's communicated in these sentence types as a starting point. Uh, and then going on to, um, to looking at each of those sentences and the mechanics of the sentence in detail. So uh, identifying the rule, um, working with students on correct me tasks. Um, uh, so there's the four sentences there. Um, and these can be used, of course, again and again throughout the rest of the term. They can be embedded as part of uh, silent starters or as um, do now activities. Uh, mm. And um, uh, and of course, uh, again, sort of, you know, later on throughout um, other units, uh, things that can be uh, come back to. Um, at the end of that sort of mini scheme within the bigger scheme, uh, students would work towards doing a parallel write from that text and um, making sure that they use that vocabulary, use those key sentence types. We have now introduced in our school um, something called Basic to Brilliant, where we look at uh, a basic or baseline version of a text of, of a response sorry and we um we pull out all of the kind of good qualities of it we look at everything that's positive and and also the things that we think um uh, could be improved and then we compare it to a brilliant version and we really sort of zoom in on the gap in between the two so that so that students sort of know how to they feel supported to um, uh, and they know how to pull together a, a baseline version but then they also know how to to um, stretch themselves to that brilliant version so if i was doing this uh, scheme now um, i would i would make sure that we would model that first paragraph and we would um, have a look at a basic to brilliant version of it um, with the with the brilliant one having the vocabulary having the key sentence types and then students are, are ready and prepared to try and work on the rest so um, in terms of where the uh, where we are now with this I know that the department um, um, has reduced the number of sentences and I think that's the right thing to do actually I think it was very ambitious at the time so they've reduced the number of sentences um, and um, sort of really going for, for depth and looking to um, implement that in a much more sort of uh, meaningful way um, and uh, that is it. That is it from me. Um, I'd really love any feedback anybody has uh, really warmly received. I need to stop because I'm worried that I'm going to go over 10 minutes. Um, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And I cannot wait to watch um, the rest of the presentations uh, later on at some point over the weekend. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thanks again to Kate for sending across her recorded talk for us today. And please do tweet with your thoughts and with your questions her twitter handle is at even better if 
Okay, so finishing up the Teach Meet is Holly Dukes. So we're going to invite Holly into the stream in a moment and Holly is going to be talking to us about how she has developed a whole school reading programme. There she is. Afternoon, Hi. Holly. Hi, Sorry to be waiting. I know we've overrun slightly, but I can see you're up and ready to go. Uh, right, okay. So mine's a little different because it's not just solely about Key Stage 3. This is about the reading programme that we've started at my academy and it goes between Year 7 and Year 11. So um, when I started this, my whole concept was what were my literacy priorities in the school? And these are the four key things that I wanted to focus on, but I thought more specifically reading was so important. And that was something that I really needed to focus on because when we've looked at our students' reading abilities, they were significantly low. And so that was something we wanted to try and improve. So my original idea that we had and that was signed off by my head teacher, this was about two years ago now, was that every student from year seven to year 10 were read to for 20 minutes once a week. So that was every Thursday or Friday, depending on what year group you were in. Um, the thing that I really wanted to focus on was that staff read to the students. So I would found research from uh, Closing the Reading Gap and uh, Reading Reconsidered, really good CPD books that really pointed towards that when a student is read to by an adult, um, that seems to improve their reading skills more so than them just sat there with a book for reading time. So we had 12 books throughout year 7 to year 10, uh, different themes and hitting different ideas that we wanted to kind of integrate into the school. And we really did emphasise that group discussion. So that's how that started. And we had that from September 2000 and one more days 2020 to uh summer of 2021 then we went through a bit more of like why we were doing this because we wanted to build on what is the point so obviously i'm assuming everybody is aware of the matthew effect so we were getting the idea of obviously the rich get richer and the poor get poorer so the word rich get richer and the word poor get poorer and we really wanted to emphasise that students should be reading more. And if I just give you a bit of context about our uh, the area that my school is in, um, you know, 49% of adults in our area have really inadequate literacy levels. So it was really important that we try to give books to students and put books in their hands. And I like that image of an empty bookcase because you know, it's really blunt and honest. That is what a lot of our students have at home. They don't they don't get access to books and things like that. They don't, you know, have the ability to actually read a book unless it's at school. So this whole concept was to give them access to more books and not just in English lessons, or if they went to the library, if they decided they wanted to go there, they've now got this further access. And I just really like this quote that I found that said, reading aloud is the foundation for literacy development. It is the single most important activity for reading success. So you, if anyone obviously has delved deeper into like aspects of literacy and uh, disciplinary list literacy, we know that obviously reading kind of starts the process and the chain reaction for everything else. If your reading ability improves, your vocabulary improves, which means your oracy can improve as well. So it all falls under the same kind of like semantic field that literacy holds. Reading is that key thing that we need to focus on. So we did that and it got really positive feedback. So this year from September, we started our new whole school read program. So every student um, is read to for 30 minutes for four days now. So it's gone from that one day of 20 minutes to now 30 minutes for four days. So it's a really, really good success that we've had. Um, again, staff reading to students. And now at the moment, there's actually 30 books from year seven to year 11. So a student coming into year seven this year, by the time they leave, they will have read at least 30 books 
across the whole school read program i mean i say at least because we're already currently contemplating putting more in so it's quite nice to see and again group discussions are promoted now i'm sure a lot of you might be sitting there saying okay but you've got to get staff on board so how we get them on board um so i've created resources for every single book that the students and staff read together that is some and i'll show you some examples of that in a bit so that's i've read through all the books made sure everything is clear for staff and then i've given them full access to those resources so they can have regardless of what pt they are if they're year seven they can access the year 11 ones if they wanted and it means that at least they're in the know so they can even talk to their classes so i've got uh, pts that are, are in year eight but they'll talk to their year nine students about the books that they're reading and it's just nice because we've got that then consistency that everybody knows what everyone is reading um a big thing that we did that seemed to work really well as well with staff is we gave staff the books beforehand so over the summer a lot of staff read all the books that they would be reading this year with their pts so then they had a good idea when something was coming up so for example when we read um so we read i am malala and they were aware of obviously some of the things that occur before they actually happen so they could pause and have that conversation with students that was really really important um and a big thing that we've got that seems to have gone down really well we've had really positive feedback from external visitors about this we have every single member of slt supporting this so we have two members of slt uh, placed across uh, different year groups and they will go into PTs every single day and read to the PTs. So it's always really, really nice that uh, students will start saying, oh, we had our, the head teacher in today and you know, he was reading the story and they really like that. So that seems to go down really well because both staff and students know it's not just something that they've got to do, everybody's involved. So we've got a whole school on board with this, which is really, really good. Um, additionally, we've got the data ready. So I've had lots and lots of um, positive feedback, but additionally, we've got reading ages available for all staff so they can access that. So they know if a student maybe isn't following along, maybe we need to put further intervention in for that. And that seems to work quite well as well. And then obviously that big one, we support the staff. So. We've got um, small group interventions for students that might struggle more so. But what was really, really important that we found, and you know, with that whole umbrella of thinking about Ofsted, we wanted consistency and the fact that every student reads the same books. So regardless if you're in a small group intervention, you are still reading the same book that you would read in the PT as well. But then you've got the support of being in a smaller group where your needs can then additionally be met. So these are just some of the um, resources that I've created. So I make a knowledge organiser for every single um, every single book that we do. And that's for both staff and I've made student friendly ones as well uh, that go on the website. So it's just quite nice. So if you don't have a chance to read the book beforehand, at least you know what's going on. So they've broken down and then I have a bit of context on the author and how it embraces our spirit values in the school, which are really, really important. And then we've got questions. So they can actually stop and ask questions which are more specific. And I've obviously got answers for all of those as well. And then we've got a dis visual display which worked really, really well. So we have those on the board. So if a member of staff walks into the classroom, they know where the member of staff is reading to or from. So I just think that's really nice as well. And then we have these across the entire school. So if you're reading a specific book, it's there, you can see it. So you can ask a student, oh, are you reading a point blank? Oh, you know, who is the protagonist of the novel? And it gets that discussion. So we're promoting our receipt as well. Now I feel like I'm doing a whirlwind tour. So I just wanted to show you the books that we've got. So currently these are the 30 books that we are actually reading during Whole School Reads. We've got some absolutely amazing books on there. And 
it's really not just improved reading abilities, which we have seen an increase on reading ages, it's also improving that love of reading. We've got, you know, um, we've got year 11 students that are just really excited about books that we're starting to read. So it's been really, really nice to see that. And so I don't keep talking because I could just talk about books forever. Um, how we've assessed it. So we've got student voices and staff voices that have been taken. And we also do the GL reading assessments to assess the reading um, ages. So we are using a lot of data, both quantitative and qualitative data to assess all of this. Um, if you do have any further questions or anything, please just um, tweet me and I will come back to you and I can send resources out as well. But yeah, that, that's me and there's my further reading, which has been really useful. Thanks so much, Holly. Uh, it was really interesting presentation there. Um, and also it's interesting to hear about reading and a lot of our presentations today have, have focused primarily on, on writing. Um, so it's, it was really nice to, to hear your um, thoughts and experiences of, of reading and implementing that programme across the curriculum. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and um, up next, we're actually going to hear from Justin um, on behalf of iPeeble. Sorry to keep you waiting there just now. Yeah. We're going to run slightly. Um, iPeeble has kindly gifted us with some devices which we're going to be raffling out in about five minutes' time. So make sure that you um, you, you keep listening uh, for a chance of winning those. Um, I won't keep you waiting any longer, Justin. Um, not a problem at all. So, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Justin, and I'm from IPVO. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I know it has been a super long session, so and we're near nearing the end. So I thought, how about let's get up and do some quick stretches together with our, you know, super duper flexible IPV visualizer. So if you can kind of relax your body a little and then you know kind of turn your neck from you know from side to side, you know, working with whatever range you have, and then up and down, you know, let your head fall down towards the chest and you know, up towards the sky. So just kind of, you know, relaxing as we're near the end. So um, hopefully you are now um, fully recharged for, you know, another tug of war with students. But um, the reality is um, you are alone. And how would you battle these remote uh, situations when you have to, you know, hold a book um, like this, point it at your webcam, um, just to let the students see what's, you know, written on it. And while losing a pair of free hands, to, to kind of demonstrate and annotate and add some sparks to your teaching. So uh, just do it like me. So with the visualizer, I have this USB cable. I just simply connect it to my laptop or Chromebooks. Um, and then I go to settings and I, I simply change my camera to, to my visualizer. And then now I just need to place um, the materials underneath um, the camera. And then you will be able to see you know everything that you that's happening on your tabletop, and you will be able to display that to your students. So now I can kind of just jump in there and do some modeling. I can you know highlight the lines you know which is you know worth discussing, or I can just simply you know circle you know the parts which I would like to discuss with the students in the future, or I can kind of throw in some you know sticky notes you know to to kind of add to my annotation. So this is really handy for online teaching, but also in-person teaching. So if you are presenting in front of a classroom, you want to show a book and you just, you know, connect the camera to a larger screen and then you just, you know, show it. And even the students on the very last roll will be able to access it. So, um, yeah, so, but the, um, for those who are, e the, the students who are eagerly creative, they might be, you know, they might not be satisfied by this rather conventional way of teaching. So. Here I kind of throw in a few, you know, uh, clay made figures. So you might wonder how how clay is related to, you know, um, English teaching. So let me just quickly uh, share my screen. So we actually provide a free uh, software. It's called the iPeeble Visualizer. So it has this stop motion feature. It allows you to kind of, you know, create stop motion videos. So what I thought is that I can, you know, kind of ask my students to convert their short stories into a, a clay play, and then I can upload it you know, onto Google Drive and share it with, you know, the rest of the world. So this is really a really effective way to kind of empower students into thinking that their words can be shared, you know, and make a big impact to the world. 
So um, let me exit screen sharing. Um, so if now I've finished doing, you know, um, showing my kind of visualizer view, I want to switch it back to a webcam view. I can just simply uh, place the camera um, back at the back of my camera and I, I'm back in a webcam view, but I'm kind of in this oops situations of, you know, being inverted. This is quite common in online teaching. So all I need to do is to swivel the camera head and then I'm back to the correct orientation. And this is super handy, you know, if you are switching back and forth between like a dot cam, a visualizer view and a, and a webcam view. And as we all, as we are all aware, the pandemic has speeded up the digitalizations in schools. This is why Visualizer has become a must-have tool for teachers to kind of accommodate this new model and the new trends of you know, hybrid teaching and visual engagement. So um, outside of education, we've also seen um, use cases of Visualizers taking place in many industries. So um, allow me to share my screen again. So we've seen librarians, they use you know, visualizers to scan books or like ID cards for documenting. We've seen doctors, they use visualizers for you know, telehealth. Attorneys, they use visualizers to present you know, like core evidence. Artists, they use visualizers to demonstrate the art creation process. So these all kind of prove that visual engagement has become a trend. Um, and that visualizer is really a helpful tool to, um, to assist people from different industries to communicate ideas in a visually engaging way. So to really wrap this up, I would like to share with you guys a, a discount code, which is exclusive um, for this session. So for those who are interested in adding a visualizer to your teacher's arsenal, um, you can kind of quote this discount code, IPVO March 5, and just email our team to get a 5% discount out of your purchase. So um, this is a, I really hope this is helpful for you guys. And um, we have also been quite um, active on uh, social media. So um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So please do come and like um, and follow us and to get the latest updates on the Visualizer products and any campaigns that we have. And finally, uh, we will be um, exhibiting at BAT uh, 2022, which is going to happen in March, uh, which is end of this month. Uh, for those who are not familiar with that, it is the largest uh, education technology show in the UK and in Europe. So um, really hope you can come by and say hi to us. Um, thank you very much, Justin. I love the stretchers. We're stretching along. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to hand over to Amy now, who has been running social media today, and Amy's going to announce our competition winner. Exciting time. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. I seem to be flicking in and out of the stream there for some reason. Uh, can you hear me all right? Perfect. Okay, uh, brilliant. So we've got seven books that have been up for grabs this morning. Um, so I'm really quickly going to read the names of the people who have won these. My sincere apologies if I mispronounce names, um, because obviously when you're going off Twitter handles and things, it's a little bit tricky to, <laughs> to get the pronunciation right. Um, so our first winner, I think we were all very jealous of this person who was on holiday on a beautiful beach um, and sent us a picture from there is Sophie Child. Um, our second winner of one of the books is Ms. T, um, who's at Imram Tahir 12. Um, so she was watching us while she was taking her car for an MOT. Um, Declan Yeomans Hill uh, was cracking some eggs in his kitchen. Um, enjoyed that uh, tweet and the pun that was in there. Um, Lauren Morris, uh, a La Prue teacher, um, has won one of the books as well, has, as has Ang. Mick, who is an, at Angela, um, and then a huge long number. Um, we've also got Miss Hood, who was in the hairdressers while she was watching us, sent a selfie from there. Um, and at Miss J Teach, so Esther Jones. So those are the winners of the books. We will tweet them out soon and we will get those delivered to you. Um, and we also have some IPVO technology as well, which um, I've selected three random winners from the people who've been tweeting us this morning. Um, so Gurav Dubey, um, who I think is based in, well, anyway, he's, he's at Gurav Dubey 3, um, has won some IPVO technology. Um, Carolina Farron, um, at Miss CD Farron, and Mr. F, 
Oh, at Mr. Finglish is his Twitter handle. And um, we loved your year at working wall. Um, so those are the winners of the, the IT, IP book kit. So well done, everybody. Thank you very much for engaging online. Um, I think you can still sign up for the recording. Is that right, Sarah? Yes, that's fine. So if you just head over to at TM English Icons over on our Twitter page, you should be able to, to access the link to sign up for that. Thanks, okay, Amy. brilliant. Well, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're bringing the Teach Meet to a close now. And I'd just like to say on behalf of the, the English team, thank you to everyone who has joined us today via Twitter or YouTube. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been watching live and shown their support to our speakers. Um, thank you also to our incredible speakers who have offered to share their expertise with the English community this morning and who very willingly given up their time to do so. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you also to our sponsors, People Progress and Teachers Love Stationery Club. Also, thank you very much to the English Icons team who have been working so hard behind the scenes today. Um, and thank you, Richard, for co-hosting with me. Thank you, Amy, for running the social media. And thank you, Rachel, for running the tech um, for doing a fabulous job there. Thanks also to Tom and Steph uh, for answering my many queries and questions um, when I've been planning this. So just a couple of exciting pieces of news uh, before we, we close. We do have our in real life event scheduled for September. That's going to be a great way to kickstart the new academic year. That's planned for Saturday the 24th of September, so please get it in your diaries. Um, if you follow us on Twitter, if, if you don't already, that's where you can find updates and event announcements. And we're going to be posting some exciting announcements very soon. Um, so that's it. Please give us a follow. Um, I hope you've enjoyed watching today. Um, thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.